Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. And tonight I have a fantastic guest. Uh, this gentleman, his name is Christopher George, and he is the founder of Anubis Paranormal, uh, which he established back in 1996. Now, he, uh, again, not only is he involved in the paranormal, that's, you know, that's not only, that's not the only thing. It's the amount of experience that he has in this field. Um, besides founding Anubis Paranormal Research Organization, he's got credentials in parapsychology and alternative history. Um, he is, uh, he was a renowned parapsychologist who studied at one of Southern California's prestigious college in their parapsychology laboratory from 1979 through 1982 um, as a research associate. Now, uh, during the 30 years that he's been in involved in this, he's investigated more than 2,500 cases of ghosts, hauntings, poltergeists, and conducted extensive studies in hauntings, cryptozoology, and the UFO phenomena. Now, he's also taught paranormal studies to students at Hodges University in South Florida, where he has shared many facets of the scientific approach to the paranormal. Now, one of the cases that he has worked extensively on is on the Haunted Queen Mary, which has been birthed uh, in Long Beach, California for several years. And uh, I mean, and, and one of the things I think is most interesting about this is that sometimes you'll have paranormal groups. They'll go a couple of times and that was the extent of their investigation. And the supernatural, it is not an on-demand thing. It's not. So it's only when you go lots of different times, different times of the year, whether it's the daytime, that's when you really get a good idea of what type of activities they're paranormal. You know, if it's intelligent, if it's residual, uh, you discount just noises that happen. Not everything has to have a paranormal or supernatural origin. So let me bring him on and we'll get this started. Hi, Chris, how are you doing? I'm good, Marlene. Thank you for having me on your show. It's absolutely, a great pleasure. absolutely, my honor, uh, Chris. I'm going to ask you what I ask everybody that's been involved in the paranormal, especially as long as you've been. Mm -hmm. How did you get started in this? Was it a childhood experience, or how did it get started for you? Well, a lot of people they are either born into it or often just discover it. In my case, particularly, I was, I think, born into it. Okay. Um, when I was very young, I was living in Leadville, Colorado, uh, which is famous for, of all people, Molly Brown, if you follow the Titanic stories. But uh, Leadville was an old mining town from the 1800s. In fact, it was going to be one of the, uh, it was going to be the capital uh, because it had more people in it at, uh, during the gold boom than Denver did. And okay. so there were many, many miners and uh, uh, individuals in the uh, town itself. But when I was... Uh, uh, about eight years old, our home was just adjacent to one of these old abandoned mines. And uh, many, many nights I'd wake up and I would see whom I thought was my dad standing in the doorway. Ooh. It was just a, <laughs> it was just a silhouette of this huge man, black, and it was it didn't have any shape to it. It was just like a shadow person, but it was just this very strong looking man. And I'd always say, hey, daddy, how are you? No response. And okay. so then I'd get up the next morning and talk to my dad. And I said, why were you standing in my door, doorway? And he said, I wasn't standing in your doorway. What are you talking about, silly child? And, but then after a while, there was more of them that would come and visit. Now, I never felt threatened. I just okay. thought they were kind of my, my nighttime friends. Okay. And so many people say, okay, your you're imaginary friends as you're a child and so forth. Well, I'm a strong believer that those imaginary friends aren't so imaginary, that they're actually real. Oh, of course. You know what? That, that imaginary friend, I'm not going to say kids don't have imaginary friends. Oh, absolutely. But. But, but I think a lot of it is something that we perceive as something different. And, uh, but within that also, there was a, a, another time when I was about maybe nine years old. I remember getting, uh, waking up and seeing this very bright light outside the house. And so curious, I got up and I went to the, the main living room window and I looked out and 
our house had kind of about a, I want to say about a six foot drop in front of it. So okay. the main street was down below. Okay. And I remember distinctly putting my head across the, the ice cold pane of glass and looking down. And here was this, at first, I wasn't sure what it was. All I saw was this gray looking form, very small, with these black eyes looking right up at me. Oh. <laughs> Oh and I God. looked at it for a minute, and I was going. I was trying to figure out what the heck are you. Uh-huh. And I just got this very quiet sound in my head. It's okay. I'm your friend. That was it. I woke up the next morning, and I had nothing to recall from that point on. But I know it wasn't a dream because I could feel that ice cold pane of glass. Right. Exactly. So, it's those details that exactly. And in a small town area, especially like in Colorado you start to see some strange things in the sky as well because that sky is so bright and Mm -hmm. so clear. And Leadville sits at 10,400 feet above sea level. It's the highest incorporated city in the United States. Wow. So we're we're literally touching the sky. I was going to say, you must have very clear skies up there. Exactly. And then after that, uh, I saw what on a camping trip right outside of town, what I assumed to have been a cryptid, which was Bigfoot, a Sasquatch. Really? And uh, he was across from our campground, and I thought it was a bear. And it just didn't walk like a bear. It didn't move like a bear. But it was very quiet. And all I could see was from the reflection of the fire. And it just instilled, and it just, just stone quiet. And when you're involved in those experiences, they don't scare you. It's after the fact that scares the pajamas Right, yeah, like it. a delayed reaction. <laughs> exactly. It's like I always say whenever we do an investigation, it's not the investigation that's scaring me or the, what's happening in the investigation. Uh-huh. It's after you get back and review the evidence and you find all of these hidden things and it's like, holy cow, I didn't even yes. know it was right next to me or that was said right next you to me. Or, or this, that, right. or that. But it really ingained, ingrained into me this kind of love of the paranormal. And so... I had two things I loved most in life. That was wanting to be a park ranger and also being a paranormal investigator. Okay. I have, a, I have achieved both in my lifetime. Okay. So I always joke, during the daytime, I'm a park ranger, and during the nighttime, I'm a paranormal hey, investigator. <laughs> but, I, but being a park ranger opened up a lot of doors for me. And it, because we, uh, as park rangers, travel across the United States. Mm-hmm. And so when I was, after all of these experiences in Leadville, uh, my, fo- my folks were transferred out here to Southern California. And so I literally had my formable years growing up out here in Southern California. Okay. And one of the one things that really intrigued me the most was the Queen Mary. I always had a love for ocean liners. And since this one was literally in my backyard, I would literally sneak on board the ship when nobody knew about it. Okay, this is what, a time that they really wouldn't, (laughs) like, have security or anything? Well, they did, but the Queen Mary, back in those days, when, and this was in the 70s and and early 80s, the hauntings were not as popular as they are now. No, I totally, and they couldn't figure out, why would anybody try to get in there? Yeah, you know, it would detour the, the, uh, the, uh, participation of being involved in a hotel or wanting to check into a alleged hotel yes. that is haunted. Yes. So they didn't advertise it. But just the history, the ship itself, and I'll get into this a little bit more of what I've discovered with the ship, but it always intrigued me. And so after I grew up, I got into, I got became a park ranger and I was transferred across the United States and actually ended up in, in Florida as well okay. for, quite, for, for about 10 years. And, uh, but during that time, I would establish, uh, subgroups uh, for, uh, APRO, uh, Anubis Paranormal Research Organization. So we've got chartered groups pretty much all over the United States. Okay. And, uh, but wherever I go, of course, I lead the organization because it was my baby. Of course. But, uh, but overall it's, it's, it's such an interesting life because you do live kind of like batman you live during the daytime as one thing and at night you're a completely other and you don't know who to 
tell that you're a paranormal investigator. Sometimes you'll get that look You like, know what? Okay. And it's only somebody like you that's been around for a long time understands that there was a time that you would say you're a paranormal investigator. Exactly. And people would look at you and go, huh? You what? Well, well, oh, yeah. And they're like, yeah. okay, yeah. Not like now. No, no, absolutely not. And when I was studying uh, paranormal studies uh, in, at a university, everybody was either calling you the spooky kids or the crazy kids. Yeah. It was not what it is today where everybody wants to jump into this field. No. And when I was going through my classes, um, it was one of the hardest courses I ever took in my life. I kid you not. And I'd taken some pretty hard courses. But <laughs> we studied everything from architecture to geology, okay. to natural science, to uh, you name it. Everything except the real good stuff. Uh-huh. And the reason for that was because our instructors really wanted us to know how to disprove utmost. because Which is very important. It is. It is because this science is so in-depth. We have more evidence than most people would have to prove in a case of, of, of a court. Yes. But we don't have, pardon the pun, the body to speak yes. of or the, the ghost to, to testify that it exists. Right. It, or it can be reproduced what, every time, you know. Because. Exactly. And so there's sciences. And every day we're making discoveries about the paranormal world. But we need to work together in order to do it. Yes. And through the 35 years, boy, I feel old, 35 years that I've been doing this, I, I discovered one thing. They're, they're, the, the real, true investigator isn't interested in fame, isn't interested in uh, becoming the big discoverer. Right. They're the ones that are out there to help the people and help the dead. Literally. Yes, uh-huh. and, exactly. And, and find the science. Yes. And, and along the way... Exactly. You know. Then you, you do discover the sciences. You do mm-hmm. you do discover the great things. But we have the potential of making such great discoveries. And yet there are so many groups out there. No, 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 this is mine. No, 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 you're not oh, touching yeah, it. Um, like, this group, this group, fake everybody this Everybody wants to grab ownership. It does. You yeah, know, do. of, of, and I'm like, hello, you know, it's like, it's, like the mentality, exactly what you said, is not where right. it should be coming from. It's no, like by you no want to own what? Are you really? Are you thinking about what you're saying? You want to own? Yeah, and and we're missing out. Like I said, because oh, yeah. somebody may have a piece of that puzzle that is greatly needed, and they don't want to mm-hmm. share. And if they don't want to share, then oh boy, we're, we're losing this. And some of the comments I, I follow Facebook, and it blows me away, especially in Europe, the backstabbing that goes on amongst the paranormal groups. Yes. And it's starting over here. And I hate to see it. And then you've got the individuals that want to jump in, they're armchair quarterbacks, they just watch Ghost Adventures or uh, you know, some television show and they know everything. Exactly. And and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Nine times out of ten, you know, if you really do it for any amount of time, you realize that there's times when it's nothing happens. Nothing no, happens. Absolutely. No, it can go a week. It can go a month. Yeah, and you could be happens. there and you'd be like, oh, you know, like you're like, you know, it's not like, and that's the thing that a lot of these shows now show that every single time that somebody visits, everything happens. And right. I'm like, yeah, all right, okay. Well, that's called creative entertainment. And it's, it's really kind of put a false light on what we do. Uh, there have been so many times I have been in a haunted location, and I'm sitting in a dark room, and I fall asleep because nothing's happening. Yeah. And, and one of my team members have to come up and go, Chris, Chris, wake up. You're supposed to be doing this. Yes. And I've got footage of myself going. <laughs> of course, because <laughs> you're a human being and staring at a wall or staring at something after a while and nothing, you're like. Exactly. You know, yeah, it, and it, it's just human nature. But it's up to them. It's up to yes. them when they want to make contact, and they're going to know if you're a jerk. They're going to know if you're yes. you're coming in there to exploit them. But if you come in respectful, you come in there with a open invitation to make contact. 
they will do it. Yes. But they're going to be just as suspicious as we would be any person on the street that we do not know. So you've got to make an introduction. You've got to let them know what you're doing so that they will cross that barrier back to you. And it's not as easy to them. And you know and, what? There are some, and I'm talking, of course, your intelligent entities mm-hmm. or, you know, that yeah. they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> No. They don't want to have nothing to do with you. You know, it's like you could sit there and as they, if they find a basement or an attic to disappear into, they're yeah, gone. So they're gone. Well, it's just like us. Like I said, you're walking down the street and you have somebody coming up and asking you questions. How are you going to feel? You're going to like, get the heck away from me. Leave me alone. And you, you take off running. And yeah. that's exactly the way they are. And so there are some that are very, very open and very communicative. And there are others that, just like you're saying, do not want to talk to us at all. They just want to be left alone to do what they're doing. No, no. They, they, I mean, it, they're, they're grumpy. You know, it's like. <laughs> well, they are. They are. And it's, um, it's strange to see the differences when it occurs. Uh, you can go, like you said, into one place that is reputedly up and down the door, and for a week, nothing. And then you finally say, well, the evidence shows there's nothing going on, so I can't say if the place is on it or not. But you go to a place like the Queen Mary, and it's jumping all the time. You know that what? That ship and, is and I, you know, I, I had known about the Queen Mary, and, you know, I had read, but, you know, I, I, I freshened up my research on the Queen Mary, and that's incredible. Let me, mm-hmm. And and I'm gonna get. I'm gonna ask you when we get into this thing about the Queen Mary. But from what you're telling me, you know, you start in childhood. <laughs> to, mm-hmm. Wow, and you basically you followed through on it. Okay. Right. In other words, that fascination, that interest, you took it with you into adulthood because a lot of people have those experiences that you described in childhood, and sometimes depending on the reaction they get from their family or whatever. They just it kind of they leave it behind as they grow older, right? You know, and they just even if they know it's real, they kind of like nah, yeah, whatever. But you obviously you went and you kept at it, and mm-hmm. like we said, you know, you went through the the thing of where sometimes there's nothing there, or sometimes it's not an on-demand thing, and you know, you persevered. Um, and I know you said that you were involved very heavily in the Queen Mary, and from what I've seen, it's got a lot of entities or a lot of. It does. Is this because there's vortexes or doorways there, or are these all tied into actual, you know, well, incidents there? Well, from it, it's a combination of all. Uh, Queen Mary is a magnet. Uh, it is believed that there is a vortex and good evidence to support it that the heart of the ship is the main pool area. Now think of it as when you're alive and you're on this great huge ship. There's not a lot to do, but one of the big draws is the swimming pool. You're absolutely so right. a lot of people will go to that swimming pool and the laughter, the fun, the yes. harmony that's taking place, that's all positive energy. Yes. And so that carries over and I think that's what opened up that door. Okay. But there has been a lot of tragedy on the Queen Mary as well. And the, it's there have been wartime deaths. There have been incidents where she actually ran over the uh, escort ship, the Curaçao. Exactly, ran, yes. And sank with over 400 people at her, because of her bow. She couldn't stop. So those poor men were left to literally drown. Mm-hmm. Um, she had wartime criminals, Nazis, uh, that were being transported from Germany over to the United States that died under really severe conditions. There okay. wasn't air conditioning like we know. So, And then just tragedies in general. Uh, but in addition to that, when a person dies, would you rather haunt a very depressing, very macabre-looking place or would you like to go where there's a lot of people having fun, a lot of good no, memories that you shared? And that is what the Queen Mary is. Most of the entities that are there are reliving their happy life. They love that ship. They want to still be a part of it. The ship has not changed in almost 100 years. It's still the same layout. It's and still the same layout. It still has the same decor. Now, there's been a few upgrades. And in fact, she's actually having a facelift done as we speak because she was in pretty bad shape. 
So the city and private groups have gone ahead, and they are giving her a break. And okay. uh, the last time I was there was about a week and a half ago, and they are really working hard on her. And she was looking at that. But um, I think that's going to also increase the activity, because whenever you do renovations, the yes. spirits are going, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're yeah. disturbing my home here. What are you you. Yes. So I was kind of getting a, a feeling for what was going on out there with some of the guests. And everybody, everybody you talk to will either look at you kind of sheepishly like, why are you asking me that? Or they'll jump right into it. Yes, yes, I did have an incident last night that this happened or that happened. And uh, But it's, it's almost like, a, and I know these for a fact, this happens, and I'm sure many of your, your viewers do the same. But when you carry, when you die, you carry over your, your little tendencies with you. So if you're a prankster in life, yeah, you are well going yes. to be a prankster in death. Yes. And uh, in one of the cases, we had a situation like that with this poor girl. She was, she was going home, and she felt like she was being watched all the time in her, in her apartment. And uh, she went to bed, and the bed started jumping up and down. Oh. On and it was scaring him. That's poor thing to do. So they called us in, and we started to investigate. And with my team, I've got a mixture of uh, uh, scientists, uh, electricians, technicians, uh, clairvoyants, medium, the whole gang, because I want to have make sure that we have all of our bases covered. Well, the thing that we figured out was about a month prior to this girl's incident starting, a young man had been killed on a motorcycle down the street. We were oh. able to contact the, the spirit of this boy. And he said, I just saw on the street and I followed her home. She was cute. And boy, <laughs> isn't it funny when I jump up and down on her bed. And so that's what it was. He was jumping up and down on her bed, making her bed jump. So, you- so this poor girl was suffering from the practical joke of this teenage boy that had been killed. But you and, know what, Chris? A lot of people don't realize that that can happen. Absolutely. That this didn't really occur in her house or yes. to any of her uh, either family or relatives. Family, you know, no friends. <laughs> this ha- happened, like you said, down the street. Yes, and he and, took a life to her. And people don't realize that you could, ha- you know, you hear sometimes of people saying, well, I live in this house and nothing happened. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. the, I started mm-hmm. having these things. And, you know, you, of course, ask them, well, what happened? What's going on? And. You know, and people sometimes, a lot of paranormal investigators fail to ask them exactly what you asked them. Was there any serious accident or did something happen at your workplace or anything like that? Sure. Because stuff like that, it, you know, they're not necessarily going to be tied, like you said, back to their own home or wherever. Mm-hmm. Look at this. He he thought she's cute and I'm going to hang out with her and Absolutely. give her grief, you know. Well, and so many, yeah, so many people take it for Hollywood, shall we say. Yes. And this is far from Hollywood. Uh, a lot of times in my classes that I would teach parapsychology, I'd hold up two pictures. A house that was just finished being built and an old decrepit house. And I'd say, okay, which one of these two pictures shows the haunted house? And, of course, you'd all, a good 80, 90% would see the old house. Okay. And I'd say, why? Well, it's been around for a while. People have moved in, moved out. And I said, but what if I were to tell you it's the new house? Well, there's been no death. There's nothing in it. It's not the house. It's the property that's haunted. Okay. And they don't realize that you can build a brand new house on a property. It can be shiny, clean as a whistle, and then all of a sudden you can have paranormal activity. And it's Mm -hmm. because of what was once there or who was once there that doesn't want to give up on that location. And so there are so many misnomers out there because of people watching these TV shows and watching these movies and expecting to see what is going on in that world. And there's such a variety and variation of things. You just don't know what you're going to get until you start to get it. And it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of patience. And it takes a lot of teamwork. Yes. And and if you have to have a really good, dependable team that's willing to stay up all night and then have to go to work this morning or, mm-hmm. or something along those lines. Because 
nothing is worse than getting somebody in and saying, okay, yeah, okay, I've been here for four hours. I'm ready to go home. Well, that's not going to do anybody any good. We just of course not. Unless and you're extremely so, lucky, but that doesn't exactly. usually happen. No, and again, people are, are looking at it as a, a fun adventure. Oh, I get applicants all the time that want to join us that say, I'm just looking to find ghosts. And wrong. We're looking to find answers, not yes. looking to find ghosts. Uh, but we have a very, very strong recruitment process in the training program. In addition to that, when we go out into the, uh, uh, to investigate a location, we have basically a questionnaire, mm-hmm. but in reality, it's a psychological Okay. And they don't know it, so there's key questions that I ask that I look for in the psychology and the makeup of the person, because nothing is more tragic than to find out that somebody really truly believes that their location or their abduction or they've seen uh, a Sasquatch or, or some kind of cryptid, they're dead to right. They believe 100% what they are encountering. But yes. is it because of something else. Is there, are they on a particular medication or are they had a particular strainful uh, disruption in their life that could be accounting for odd dreams that they may interpret as real? Mm-hmm. These are the things that we try and dis- discover before we go into any investigation. For the most part, you know, these people are A, B, C, and D, and this is what happens. And they may have witnesses to back up the collaboration. So right. we take that to serious. But it's, many a time we'll go here, in Colorado in particular, when I was there with my group there in Denver, we get calls. I think I got five calls in six months. Uh, we're hearing rappings behind the bed. Okay. Things are moving up in the attic. We're scared to death. Can you come and investigate? Okay. So we would go in. We would do the interview, of course, it sounded like something was there, we set up equipment, and sure enough, there would be scratching up behind the bed. And all of a sudden, a few minutes later, you'd hear movements up in the attic boxes moving. So we got the camera set up, we got all the, the equipment. Well, that scratching in the wall was rough. Well, I was about to say. And yeah, uh-huh. the, the movement and the footsteps upstairs was a raccoon that had gotten in and was going through the boxes. So you come back and you tell the people, we discovered what your situation is. You have nothing to worry about. It was a, it was rats. You just need to get an exterminator. You end that and board up the open area near the window with a raccoon coming And they're disappointed, in. right? <laughs> and they look at you like you just slap them in the face. And I had a woman say, what What do you mean my house isn't haunted? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why, aren't we good enough to be haunted? And you yes. look at them like, you're scared to death when you contact me, and now you're oh mad at me. You know what, Chris? I have to <laughs> laugh because that's exactly, not at the beginning, because I've been doing this for a long time also. That, but this has started happening in the last few years. Exactly that. People contact you. They're scared. Oh, and you know, and these feelings and like that. We hear noises or whatever they're describing. And they're like, please hurry. Come, you know, help us. So when you get there, you know, you, you find something along those lines or, you know, or, or when you meet them, you, you start realizing you're all excited about this. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. you are really hoping that not only am I going to confirm it, what you really want is for me to identify the name or whatever. Yeah, exactly. They And I hate to say it, a lot of them are, are hoping to have this big exposure. Oh, well. Yeah. And I've had people say, do you think ghost hunters will come and, and sh- do a show on our house? Yeah, I was like, I don't no. know. <laughs> but when they, I, I, that's why now I ask them, what do you want to – because before I'd be like – you know, they're almost afraid to tell you beforehand until you get there. Yes. Once you realize that you're you're not scared, you're hoping yeah, yeah. that I'm going to yeah. tell you how many, what their names are, what they want, exactly. So that, and exactly. so now I, I I always ask them, you know, what do you what do you want out of this? You know, if if it does turn out you've got something, what, right. is, what is your expectations? You know, because now I, before I would I, literally people when they say, hey, I don't. I'm scared. They really were sure. scared. Now yeah. it's right. And and, I'm like, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, and that's where you got to really look at it too. Is 
the severity of the case. If you go in there and they're all smiles and, 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 and oh boy, excited, you know, you're too excited about this. Exactly. But you see the ones that are in tears, they're afraid for their children. Yes. Those are the ones we take priority on. Yes. Something traumatic is happening to yes. them that they cannot understand. They don't want this. They don't want publicity. They mm-hmm. don't want a book deal or a movie deal or a TV show. Like, yeah. They just want whatever it is to stop and leave them in peace. And you know what? That's exactly right because a lot of times – that I've gone in from a lot of things, it's because I've, they've told them, she knows how to keep her mouth shut. She will keep your confidence. You don't have to worry. They don't want a boatload of people no. coming out in front of their house, coming out with all this stuff. They want, like, they don't want their neighbors. They don't want anybody no. to know that somebody's going in there to help them with this. Exactly. Okay? That's when you also can tell, you know, that these people, they're scared, but at the same time, they, like, Want to mm-hmm. keep that low profile? Absolutely. You and know? when we when we arrive, we don't have vans marked a new right. paranormal <laughs> yeah. research organization. Exactly. With a ghost on the side. Exactly. I mean, that's not what we're about. We're about helping the individuals. So we drive in our own cars. We park out. We yes. carry our equipment in sporadically, not all at once, so we don't right. draw attention. Because again. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to help these people or are we trying to go, hey, here I am. Hey, TV show. Right. Oh, okay. Book deal. Hey. And you, <laughs> you know, know what? Maybe and, you'll, and, uh, and you made a very good that. point, Chris. There are people out there who really are truly experiencing something very frightening. Yeah. But at the same time, they this is so out of the norm for them that yes. they don't want to be labeled by either their neighbors, even their family, who knows, that they've got something like this going on, you know, well, or that the, they're going to show up on somebody's, sh- on somebody's show. Exactly. And the way it's interpreted in the press anymore, uh, it, it's always negative. They always make you look to be half crazy. Mm-hmm. And uh, then what happens is, just like you're saying, the crazies do show up mm-hmm. out in front wanting to experience what they are experiencing. Yes. So now all of a sudden you've got people clamoring all over your front yard. They're stomping on your, your plants. They're trying to peek in the yes. windows. Yes. And that is sometimes even more traumatic than the activity that's occurring on the paranormal side. Yes. Uh, at least a ghost doesn't go out and stamp all over the flowers. At least you hope not. No, but, but yeah, no. And, and, and some of them, they're like, I, I mean, I've gone to somewhere. It's a very upscale neighborhood, very gated, very, you know, this. Exactly. And where everybody's like, you know, like the last thing they want is their neighbors to know. Exactly. That this exactly. is going on. But at the same time, they're, they're at their wit's end. Sure. Sure they are. And it's so it's a very fine sword that we walk on. Yes. In this para- paranormal community. And, uh, you know, I've talked with several groups across the, the country and been involved in National Ghost Hunting Day. And, uh, you know, spoken with other people that are really trying to do the right thing. And we're trying mm-hmm. to create a coalition to make basically help understand what it is really to be a ghost hunter, uh, to be a paranormal investigator. I like that term better than ghost hunter yes. uh, because a paranormal investigator is involved in everything as we exactly. are. Exactly. It's not strictly just ghosts. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. And everybody that, that hears that you're in a parapsychologist, they think first off, oh, you, you, you chase ghosts, you hunt ghosts. Well, I don't hunt them. They just come and visit me. Or they right. come and visit our team. We don't. We're not going right. to cage them and take them back to the zoo and put them out mm-hmm. for display. Uh, but overall, it's we. There is such a gluttony now compared to years ago oh, of yeah. paranormal investigators. And again, it just. It, I'm starting to see reports of uh, across the uh, the world of certain paranormal groups that just think it's a joke, and yes. they'll go in and they'll vandalize a place. Um, a certain celebrity, I'm not going to name his name on TV, which we all know about very well, is going through some issues, but he expects everything to be okay. Yes. These individuals are making a bad name for us. Well, and it yeah. really is making us all look like we're all a bunch of, of freaks and idiots trying to yes, do this. Yes, exactly. And uh, exactly. the ones that, especially the more famous ones, People mm-hmm. idolize them. They they they, yes. they just would love to be a part of their teams or be involved with that group. And then when they let us down, it's like everybody is that way. 
I don't ever want to deal in the paranormal again. I don't ever want to watch any TV shows again. And and so on and so on. And it's a shame because 98% of all the groups out there are doing it for the right intentions. Yes. It's that other 2% that is always the ones that get caught that always make the rest of us look bad. Oh, and yeah. That, they, they, just, you know, it my heart. that they, you know, number one, that you could tell it's contrived. Let's go start with that one. <laughs> number one, so, it's contrived because anybody that's done this work for any amount of time knows that it's very seldom that you walk in. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. It can. Mm-hmm. But you walk in there right off the bat and things are, right. are not only happening, but that you can actually capture it right then and there. Oh, absolutely. Okay? absolutely. You know, that happens, but a lot of times it just doesn't work out that way. Mm-hmm. Um also, like, uh, same thing that we talked about, the people that are involved, the families. How serious right. are they? Or are they part of the the circus? I'm going to call it the circus because that's what Certainly. some of these look like. And I've seen others that uh, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? They, they let out what that location is. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, I feel sorry for those poor people that live in that area if it's a specific mm-hmm. house right. that is in that surrounding area. Because guaranteed, chances are, they're going to get affected because, like you said, then all of a sudden you've got this bunch of people that all of a sudden it's like this is the place yeah. to go to, you know. Well, look, look at the Amityville house. Oh, that's to a, this day. It's, that was it's, what thirty, what forty oh, years? Oh, seven, say, yeah, forty years ago, seventy four, seventy four. And uh, so, even to this day, they get people camping out on their their front doorstep, and there hasn't been an activity allegedly for quite a while. But it's got that stigma attached to it, and I, 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 and you know what? I'm I'm now that you brought up the Amityville horror, Chris. I'm going to ask you. I mean, everybody knows the the Amityville horror part, the Lutz. You know that they kind of like were there like what less than a month, and and then the book and all that. But the truth is that there was a really horrible murder, right, the murders, DeFerris. yeah, the DeFerris. under the worst circumstances. Mm-hmm. Do you really think that? prior to the Lutzes coming in, that there was anything paranormal or anything negative effect? I mean, when you listen to the, the, the thing about the family, the Feos, they, mm-hmm. sound like a, they sounded like a very dysfunctional family. Right. You yeah. know, to begin with. But, you know, what? there's a lot of dysfunctional families that don't end up with all of them getting killed. So, I, I think what happened, and from all my research into that, and... Uh, um, I have spoken to Lorraine Warren about this uh, mm-hmm. on several issues. And, of course, they, they, they make it look like the Warrens were much more heavily involved than what they were. Right. But the thing is, there was something that occurred. Now, whether it was psychological with Ronnie DeFeo or not, we can't really determine. He, he claimed that he heard voices telling him things. Now, one of the, the biggest energies there is, is negative energy. When right. a family is dysfunctional, it emutes all of this horrible yes. energy out into the universe. Something dark can attach itself or be drawn to that. Yes. Now, who's to say that Ronnie DeFeo didn't practice some kind of uh, Ouija board or something right. that could have initiated something to open up a portal in order to accommodate that? Now, as in all my research, I do believe in demonic activity. I have actually been... Uh, witness to demonic activity it's not a pretty picture but demons can disguise themselves as very benign things in the beginning and Mm -hmm. the whole purpose of a demon is to attack and destroy a family unit well this is the thing also you listen his lifestyle he was into drugs Mm -hmm. i'm sure that people let's put the family out of the picture besides the dynamics of the family if you look at what his lifestyle were who he was hanging out with Mm -hmm. he was doing a lot of heavy drugs Based sure on what I've heard, you know, and this mix of, you know, you're, you can't be a drug addict unless everybody around you is doing the same thing, you know. Right. So, I mean, he could have picked it all up besides, and you know, and then you add into oh, that, that what was going on with his own family. So, right. Well, with with drugs, like when you brought up the uh, the profit, the uh, aspect of the drugs, uh, DMC in the in is a high use drug. And what it does is actually open and alter consciousness. Mm -hmm. So anything that may be on that other side can easily be made aware both ways. That, oh, you're looking at me, I'm going to look back at you. You're drawing this attention. So I think it was a number of factors with Ronnie DeFeo. He hated his father. Yeah. 
he was dysfunctional in life. He was uh, a rich kid with with poor upbringing per se. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there was you know all of these negative aspects about it, but he did love his family, his his siblings. Right. It, it, it's you could tell it's like kind of like a weird thing. Like you you love him, but at the same time, especially with his dad. Exactly. And it it caused a lot of pain and a lot of grief. Now, a lot of that can be explained away psychologically. Mm -hmm. The thing that has always perplexed me is here you have a house, quiet early morning hours, around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh Uh-huh. Gunshots, not just pistols, but a, a rifle. Right. Being shot. And if you, growing up in Colorado, when you heard a rifle... It can be three, four miles away. Okay. So, so you would think that in the middle of a residential area. Somebody would have heard something. Of course. The second thing, they were all sleeping. Yes. One shot would have woken anybody up in that family. Yes. Yes, inside the house, of course. And that is one of the keys that has always intrigued me, is why that did not happen. Mm-hmm. Unless something beyond what we understand was in control of that. Yes. Now, with the Lutzes, after this whole situation, I discovered that George Lutz was a practitioner of dark arts. I had never heard of that. It's, this oh, is very you're kidding. Rare. Christopher, the son, is coming forward with a lot of information, and I know Christopher. And uh, he has stated that George was very involved into the dark arts. and When you mean dark arts, do you mean he was... A Satanist, a, a black magic well, practitioner, I mean... As as far as what I've been, there's some things I can't reveal. Okay. This is bringing that out himself. But the situation is that there was some dark practices okay. taking place. So that could either be, you know, one or the other. Do you, but, think, do you think that because he was involved in that, it was on purpose that they bought that house or coincidental that it drew him... And that's the that's the other big question that no one has ever really ever discovered or really found out is the house was reasonably priced for for a size of it was, but it was also known to be a murder house, right? Which a lot of people a like forget house. it. Yeah, it's a multi murder house. So did George purposely go after this particular property a for the price or because it was connected to something dark? And right. many people think hey, you can have your cake and eat it too if you're right. involved in that. And so these things, if laying dormant in that house for just a while, okay, to the other side, time is irrelevant. Mm-hmm. But exactly. the thing is, here comes somebody else. Now, was George drawn there? That's another option. Right. Uh, so what You know, was maybe he, he was one that? of these guys that said, this is a great house for this price. Who yeah. cares if a bunch of people were killed? Right. For, I'm going to take my chance. I'm going to get this house. I mean, it could be too. Well, a lot of people will not buy a house if they find it. Of course, you have to use the politically correct term now, stigmatized. Uh, the, but by law, you are supposed to report if something happened in that house, what? That, whether it's also haunted or whether it's yes. had a bad history or whatnot before the deal is done. If the potential owner asks that right there is like that's the key see you gotta ask by the way is this house haunted or has there something happened to this house then by law they have to disclose it but you can't say that it's oh yes it's it's haunted it's stigmatized and i love that term and you know what and there's some people that legitimately might not know you know what if something happened 20 years before and you you know had a couple of owners and by the time you got it you didn't know about it well, it goes back to that whole thing. Is it the house that's haunted or is it the property that's haunted? Yes. And so every and, – and that's the thing I, I, I find interesting is that any place can be potentially haunted. Any entity can follow you home. Yes. Any item can have an attachment. Yes. You go to yes. an antique store, buy, buy this beautiful rocking chair, and then you bring it home, and then two days later it starts rocking by itself. And you're like, huh? <laughs> okay, Hello. And the you know what? No, it's the a chair. lot of people live on, especially because of these shows, that the ghosts are only in that house or in that place or, you know, and it's like, and by the way, when you mentioned, you know, that a lot of these people that go in there and they're really not sure what they're doing and they start doing what they shouldn't. And like you said, somebody comes home with you. 
<laughs> you know, and you're exactly. like, and then all of a sudden, it starts things start happening that you're like, wait a minute, you know. And well, I'm not going to say it happens all the time, but it can no. happen. Well, it's just like people with using Ouija boards. Oh boy. <laughs> Ouija boards to me are the most, one of the most dangerous things. It, it, it's not, it's not the board. And that's what I tell people. It's not the board mm-hmm. that is the problem. It's the intention that you are inputting into yes. the board. And if you do not know how to use it correctly and close it correctly, mm-hmm. you're leaving that as open a door as in you're leaving the front door of your house open. Anything and anybody can walk and through it. If you're if you're doing drugs, if you're drinking, oh yes. If you've Absolutely. got all this other stuff going on in your head, and you start mm-hmm. playing with a Ouija board, guaranteed that what you're putting out is an. Dark. Hey, yeah. if you're dark and sinister and evil, here I am. Exactly, <laughs> it's a neon sign to them. It yeah. really, truly is, and people don't get it, and that's the. the that's why there's got to be something out there that we do as professionals, the, the groups and, and so on. And it is starting to come about. Uh, I'm involved in the International Paranormal Research Association, too, which is, a, is going to try and draw uh, individuals and uh, groups together to try and create a standard in right. order to, not to tell you how to do it, right. that's up to you, but to give you guidelines as to do it correctly. And right. that is what's important is so many people, well, let's go out and have a sign, uh, have a, uh, a seance with the Ouija board and we're only 15 years old. No. Yes, I know. And unfortunately, everybody thinks that's, or let's go to the cemetery. It's like, it's so cool. It's so cool. We'll get it. We'll see a ghost. Yeah. It's not just a ghost that that's a problem. You go out to a cemetery, you could fall into an open grave. Yes. You could yes. you, something. You know, <laughs> there are other dangers out there. Well, how many people already up in the paranormal group? That that couple that was out uh, on the railroad tracks on the bridge that was killed not here not too long ago. Really? I don't Cat- know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was a couple that uh, they had. They were doing EVP sessions. They had they had oh, uh, earbuds in their ears, and they were on a trestle. The train came along, killed them both. And so it's those are dangers that we have to pursue. I, I'm going to look that up. But you know what? And when you say that, believe it or not, they did um, about a couple of months ago something. And I'm going to segue real quick where they were saying that kids were playing that chicken on the trains. Oh, yes. And yes. everybody thinks that you're going to hear this train way before it gets there. And they showed how basically you really become aware of the train when it's right on top exactly. of you. So I can imagine if they had something over their ears or they're trying to pick up EVPs. Mm-hmm. Because you would think, who's not going to see a train Mm -hmm. barreling towards you? But yeah, especially if you're thinking, I'm going to hear it. No. Uh, I I had not heard that story. That's that's very sad. And so these things are are starting to happen because, again, they're just not – they're seeing the glamour and the glory of TV, and and God bless them. They think they're doing the right thing, but it's it's putting everybody in danger. Yes. And uh, when I taught my classes down at Hodges, uh, some of the interesting remarks I heard were were incredible. Well, for example, um, would it be okay for me to get into a box in an open grave and have somebody put dirt on it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to laugh because... <laughs> well, you, you know, sometimes you have to bite your lower <laughs> like, you because, <laughs> but these people are serious, and it's like, no, I know that's the that's the sad part, and that's, that's the scariest part. But that to them, they're very sincere, they're very true. Uh, is it okay for me to go into the graveyard after hours, even though the front gate is locked? Oh, if you want to get hit up for trespassing, sure, exactly, exactly. So, but to them, they think, well, if I carry my ID card, will it be okay that shows that no. I'm a ghost hunter? No. No. And but again, you're, you're looking – as a park ranger, we always say make sure that you are prepared for the stupidest questions on earth. But to the individual, they're the most sincerest. And you know and what? You're tr- probably you're right as a park ranger. I bet you heard a bunch of them that you'd be like, huh? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, one, of, one of my favorites is uh, Mr. Ranger, sir, and I would say yes. And um, if I follow this trail through the park – to the exit. Is there a way back in? Oh. <laughs> and you're like... You, <laughs> you, you have to stand for a, a multi-second and go, is this person serious? 
or what? <laughs> right, so, like, or are they just are they are they joking and trying to see what I'm going to say in response? Well, I'm in the process of writing a book uh, on haunted parks and locations, and I'm going really? to add a lot of those anecdotes along with it through the through the story. But uh, I'm, 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 yeah. wait, I'm, hold that thought because before I let yeah. you go, I, I want to go back a little bit. Sure. You said that you had experience what you consider demonic um, presences, entities, whatever. Can you tell me about that? Because coming from somebody like you, and the reason why I say this, Chris, is that nowadays everything is a demon. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, and and not everything is. And of course it's not. Demonic encounters are extremely rare. Mm-hmm. But yes. uh, I, was, I was brought up in the Catholic faith, yes. and I went to a Catholic high school for a while. And uh, one of the priests came to me one one day, and he said, "Chris, you're you're a very intelligent person. You seem like you're an individual that doesn't get spooked by pardon the pun spooked by by many things." And I said, "No, Father." And I says, "I'm pretty practical. I have to look at things logically." And he says, "Would you mind assisting me with me uh, on on something that I need to do?" Now he didn't go into detail, but I said, "Well, sure, Father." And he says, I have a family that, that needs some help from the church, and I just need somebody there as a witness. Because, again, during that time, during high school, uh, it was not a very favorable thing. And the Catholic faith does not go on and to investigate an exorcism unless it has been verified right. one through a hundred times yes. before they even walk through the door. Yes. And uh, so, But he needed somebody there as somebody that has a logic had a logical sense about him that right. wouldn't wouldn't uh, freak out by something mm-hmm. off the bat and so uh, father mckinley and i went to this residence uh, he did tell me he says there might be a problem in, he says there's been an alleged haunting he didn't say demonic okay but he did say haunting and i said okay father because he had heard i had been interested and had had some encounters with the unknown and again, the spooky kid. Uh, <laughs> hey, like, it is what it is. <laughs> but, but the thing, but the thing was, we did walk in to the house, and the 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 only way I can describe it is that it's like walking into midnight. Okay. And your most intense fears are coming into realization. Your stomach. It's all knotted up. You feel sick to your stomach. There's, there was this horrendous stench about okay. the place. And the thing was, we discovered it moved. It was never centrally located. Because the first thing I thought, did they take their trash out? Right. Um, is their sewer blocked up? Uh, is there garbage disposal out? Right. So I'm looking for all the logical explanations. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, so... We went, we spoke to these people. These people were absolutely traumatized beyond belief. It looked like they had not slept for a month. They had dark circles under their faces. Okay. They were relatively a young-looking couple in their mid-30s, but they looked like they were in their 60s, I kid you not. Yeah. And, and something like that will do it to you. And they just were absolutely pathetic in all aspects. Things started to move. Things started to shake. When uh, the priest went ahead and started to say a blessing, uh, a glass flew and hit it. Wow. And uh, so at that point, I'm going, okay, this isn't it. And I was about to ask you, Chris, you must have been like, uh, <laughs> this, I, is, this, is, this must have been astounding to you. It was. And it, it, it's where you're, at that age, you know certain things, but I think God gifts certain people certain abilities to recognize certain things, there's a mission, I think, for everybody in this life. And I think part of this is, is mine, is trying to discover and help people through this process. Okay. Um, but at that point, I realized, whoa, there is more going on here mm-hmm. than anything I'm familiar with. And so I'm still trying to rationalize all this. Right. Well, did, we just, did we just have an earth tremor, and is that why the glass yeah. flew across? Yeah. Uh, but then you started hearing the growling. Wow. You started hearing this, this pounding on the walls. Uh, he took out a, a crucifix and put it on the table in preparation to say a prayer with it, and it went flying across the room. And at that time, 
father looked at me and he said, Chris, I'm sorry I brought you into this. You, you can leave if you, if you need to. And you're and thinking... I'm in it now. I'm yeah. in it now. And, but I had to be prepared because when we left, he says, now, if you wish to help me on this, he says, I can't ask you to do what I need, but I can have you give me what I need in order to do this. I'm not going to put you in any danger. When a kid is that, when he's 17, 18 years yeah. old, you hear that, it's like, you're not going to put me in danger? There's I know. <laughs> I thought I was just going to, like, hand you stuff. <laughs> yeah, danger? Well, you know. So I had to really, really choose at that point a direction in my life. Was I going to be able to do this? Because I also realized that there are not so friendly human ghosts out there as well. Oh, of the course old not. adage of people saying, oh, a ghost won't hurt you. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it won't bother you. I <laughs> no, no. I have, my own, I have my own, like, yeah, I, I, got, I, got I can get on my soapbox and go on and on and on with that, that, exactly. that aspect of it. But let me ask you, did he know before that time that he went with you? Was he aware or was this his first time to confirm that? This was, well, the, there had been uh, other priests that had gone to... Uh, give a report to the bishop, and then okay. the bishop assigned him to the case. Oh, I see. I get it. I get so, it. So, yeah, because you have to be trained as a trained right. exorcist. Because I was thinking, this poor man walked in on this with um, being not really prepared for it. Oh no, like... he, no, he was prepared. He was. I wasn't, but he was. Okay. Um, but th- 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 that particular case, I was only involved in the very beginning uh, because there again, I was at my a- age. The the church was saying, well, why are you using Chris? Uh, he's not an ordained minister. He's not right. any of this. He's a teenage boy. But again, during that time, there was not as many exorcists. Uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 the critique and the, and the evaluation process was very in-depth, but they had to have witnesses outside of the family okay. in order to collaborate what the priest was seeing. And so I was on the ground level, just the ground level of what right. was happening. So with my report and, and what I was able to, pr- to provide to the church and to the bishop, it was gone ahead with, and the, the actual exorcism did take place without me being involved. It, it dealt with other priests, right. but it just confirmed the case in order to go through it. But, um, yeah, that was one of the hairiest. Let me ask you, did you... Did they or did you ever find out how how this had came about? Yep. For this family, how I did indeed, I did indeed, and I'll give you two guesses, and the first two don't count. The Ouija board. There you go. So they, who was it? Was it one of the adults or? It was a. It was one of the teenage children, okay. and the, and what had happened was, she was a very lonely young lady. She wasn't a. a exactly one of the, the pretty um, cool kids. Right. And she was extremely sad all the time. She was picked on at school. Oh. So she went home and she was trying to ask questions of the Ouija board of why doesn't anybody like me? I can't find any friends. Is there anybody out there that'll be my friend? Okay. She just opened the door with that question. Yes. Will anybody out there be my friend? Mm-hmm. What manifested yep. was a young teenage boy who, in life, was very lonely too, and that he understood her problems, and that he, uh, you know, would love to be her friend, and down the road maybe her boyfriend. Everything all wrapped up in a pretty, you know. So, so she welcomes this individual that she thought was this deceased young teenage boy right. into her world. Well, it wasn't a teenage boy. I'm sure. It was a demon. And once the demon got hold, it all went to pieces from that point. And the girl continued to believe it was a boy. And she would not denounce it. She would not uh, uh, repute it. Really? Even during the exorcism, she would not do it because she would go in there and she would scream, that is so-and-so, that's my boyfriend, leave him alone, you're hurting him, you're hurting him, which gave strength to the demon. I'm telling you, but you, that, there's something wrong with that girl. I'm sorry, but oh, yeah. oh, there's yeah. something there that's not quite right, because Absolutely. just about then is when most 
if you let's say you're a teenager and I understand and you're lonely or and you're like but there's a point where you're saying, Huh? Wait a minute. Right, right. Absolutely. So and she was insisting maybe was it trying to possess her? Was that part of it, or was it just it what was, it was trying, doing in the household? It, it was trying to attach itself to her, which she allowed it. Okay. She accepted. So she right. had the attachment. Uh, then, of course, is the next processes of, of ultimate destruction. It, the whole goal is to destroy the family. Now, the family also was a very religious family, okay. very church-going family. And there again, a demonic force wants to destroy that family unity as well as any uh, connection to God. Right. And so it was, it was the perfect playground for it. Okay. Literally. And it literally took six, six or seven months for the exorcism to be completed. Wow. They had to keep going back and going back. And uh, it, uh, the girl was possessed. She wanted what she thought was the boyfriend with her. So they had to go after her. But right. I was going to say at some point. It did possess her. Uh-huh. And, and it took on all the characteristics. Of the thing, the poor girl was just, I mean, she was a poor wretched soul to begin with anyway. But by the end of this, I mean, oh, she's going to have to go through psychological uh, help for the and rest of her life. And you know what? Life. And 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 that's the the feeling that I get. That especially maybe not. Well, I don't think a family you ever really like. You know, let's let's like we'll not talk about this again. But mm-hmm. for herself individually, I think that that stays with you for the rest of your life. Oh, absolutely. How how wouldn't it? You know, it's, it's like. And that's the that's the one major thing that really gets me, Marlene, is people who walk into this don't realize that there can be consequences. Yes. If you're not psychologically prepared for it, emotionally prepared uh-huh. for it, physically prepared for it, all of those factors involved, it can turn on you. Yes. Uh, when you go on a, a investigation, you tell the spirit, do not follow us home. Yes. You close the doors you, of, of anything because... Sure enough, as, as we're sitting here, something could very potentially follow you back and yes. cause havoc to you. You upset its day. It's now going to upset your day. Well, and, and you know, that was one of the things that, you know, I was mostly worked as a freelancer because, and I worked as a freelance with a group that re- did Florida. And, you know, they would mm-hmm. call me up and they needed help or something was in South Florida. And, you know, he would ask me. And I had a lot of people always continuously, oh, I want to join your team. And one of the reasons why I never did it was because exactly what you said, vetting. And it was like, forget that. Yeah. I don't want to go through, have your boundaries ever been violated? Right, right. Because if you're a person that's had their boundaries violated, especially as a child, mm-hmm. and you never went ahead and did the inner work to make yourself okay, which a lot, not everybody does, unfortunately. Guess what? When you, if you put yourself in that setting, mm-hmm. guess who's gonna come? Like, 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 guess who's coming to dinner? Huh? Sure. You are guaranteed. You're gonna be a liability to that team. Absolutely, absolutely. You're gonna be a liability to that team. Exactly. And, and it's it's rare to find the right groups. That's yes, the problem. and that's the why you know I I would constantly have people sending me emails, oh, I want to join your group, and then I would refer, refer them to the the Florida Paranormal Research, which is the one that did all the floor, and I said, hey, I would forward their email to the guy that was running it, sure. and I said, you know, let him, because it was like, you know what, I know that there's so many little pitfalls in somebody's um, psyche, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. that, you know, they want to help, and they are eager, and they're interested, but it's like, not everybody is cut out for this. Like being interested no, or not. wanting to do it is, believe it or not, that's sometimes the least of mm-hmm. what enables you to do this work without Absolutely. bad consequences. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? Absolutely. And again, it's, it's, there's such a variety. People don't realize we walk hand in hand. There's two sides to, the, to our lives. One is in light and one is in darkness. Right. The one in light is our normal day-to-day experiences, mm-hmm. but there's this other side that we always try to put our hand across our eye not to look into because, as the old saying goes, if we look into the abyss, the abyss may just take a look at us yes. very, very carefully. And we do we encounter things of a paranormal nature happen to us every day, but we rationalize it. 
Yeah, of course. And, and, and in a way, it's good because it's I don't think we could function. A lot of people would be like, no, oh, no. no because they're not prepared for it. It's no. like uh, with, with UFOs. Are they extraterrestrial craft? We don't know for sure. Yeah. But it's, it's suspect. And it, it could be military. It could be this. But that's what you have to dis- remove yourself from the jump automatically to. Right, no, form. you know. You have to look at it from a rational point of view and look at it from all different corners before you jump to that point where you say, yes, it's paranormal in nature. Right. How many times do we look on Facebook and here's this really, really blurry, grainy picture <laughs> in it that shows, do you see the face of the ghost in the background? And, and I'm like, go, I, why? Where? Uh, yeah, I know. I, 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 see what, I see what they're talking about, but it's just the trees, the way they are. Right, it's exactly. Matrixing. And it's like, it could be anything. I it's mean, Pedoria. It could be, it yeah, could be it, a bunny rabbit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's Pedoria. It's the Pedoria process where we perceive what we want to see because that's what our brain is trying yes. to interpret. Yes. But how come every proof of, on, on Facebook or on Instagram or on all of the other social networks, every picture is so blurry and so grainy from all of these investigations. I mean, come on, people. If you're spending this yes. big amount of money on equipment, get yourself a decent camera. Well, and this was the thing, you know, we're saying way back then when there was no digital photography and people had no. to spend a lot of money just to develop stuff. And you're exactly. crossing your fingers hoping you're going to capture something. So now with digital, you would think, man, you could snap yeah. away to Absolutely. your heart. Well. And, you know, it doesn't really cost you anything except mm-hmm. – you know, you capture some, and like you said, and there's never that that one that you're like, oh. and don't. I have seen some that they're like, wow. Well, and there again, that's the next problem that we're running into in our current yes. modern technological Photoshop. world. <laughs> Photoshopping, and I mean, you can manipulate a photo yes. seven ways to Sunday, yes. and that again, I mean, I feel so. I have had pictures that have I have taken that I know I took personally. That I have posted, I don't post them because it's automatic. Oh, it's fake, it's Photoshop, yes. it's this, it's that, yes. you're this, you're that. And it's like, why even bother? I know what it is, my team knows what it is, we'll yes. put it into the files for, for whoever wants to review them and they're, they're good to go. I've had people who have said, you know, I really need your opinion on this. Would you please take your time and look at this photo and tell me what you, you see? And I always go, okay, no problem, and I'll look at the photo, but I always want the background story. Mm-hmm. What, when, where, what time, the conditions, and so on. Then my team will go ahead, and we have a lot of photo applications and, and processing equipment and software that we can take a photo, and you can pull things out. You can right. recol- re- recolor them. You can do all of the, the, the fancy gifts, but it does show – that there is something there. It's not matrixing. It's not. Yes. Uh, we, we try and give it a 3D a- aspect so that we can pull out the amount of space is being utilized versus the the ambient space. Mm-hmm. And those. That's the science. Right. That's exactly. Exactly. And I and I send a file back to the person or persons or groups that submitted, and I say, okay, in photo one, this is what we discovered. In photo two, this is how this was discovered. And so forth. So they have an actual report. Right. And, and what you thought was something, it turns out it's not. turns out nothing. nothing. And uh, it, but, but then and there, every now and then, you do get something that says, mm. you know, I can't explain it. You have something that is an anomaly. Yes. And I like personally, I, sometimes I like better those photographs where things are caught incidentally. Not mm-hmm. because you were trying to capture something, but when people are posing for a picture. Yes. And then you, those are great, I think, because yeah. the intent behind it was not to ca- capture any type of phenomena or, or ghost right. or anything. Right. But then here it is. Or, you know, people, they're on vacation and, you know, they're taking a picture, like what everybody right. does when you're a tourist, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you can always also tell the ones that are set up. Yeah. Is why did they have a camera there right at that particular time? Yeah. Uh huh. Do they normally have a camera there? No. Well, you know what? I've had, and I tell everybody, when you do, I, I mean, personally for me, I would have a lot of things start happening. Once I was going to get on a case, I would, sometimes even before I got on the case, a couple of things would trigger on. And I didn't have, I wasn't walking around with a camera or, you know, or anything to capture. It was like, you know, well, okay, now I know this, you know, whatever. But 
it's like you said, that coincidence, sometimes, yeah, it calls into question like, wow, that was pretty convenient. <laughs> well, you have to be skeptical to begin with. Of course. But then you also have to be open-minded. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are so quick to say, nope, that's it. No, nope, no, nope, can't be because I didn't take it. It's not on oh, no. my website. It's not by my team. So no. I'm not going to compete with you, so I'm going to slander you. What? You know, yes. that's, that's the wrong attitude. Yes. Let's work together. Maybe you can find something in this photograph that I missed or my team missed, and you can help us, and yes. we can help you. That's what this is supposed to be about. It's like if you're having an operation and a doctor comes in and, and says, oh, I'm not sure how to remove this problem. And you've got another doctor there that says, well, I do. And he, the one doctor says, nope, nope. This hey, it's is my, my patient. <laughs> yeah. You're laying there going, eh, what? I'm going to die because you two are competing with each other? No. Work well, together. And you know what? A few, this was a few years back. Um, I had a team from Fort Lauderdale ask me to go down to Key, Key West with them. And they rounded up. They were they were going to pre scout because somebody was going to film with them. But you know they have Robert the Doll down there. Yes, I'm familiar with Robert. Okay, I, I was familiar with Robert the Doll. So we go and we were going to do an overnight at the museum over there with. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember they have it at that time because sometimes they they lend it around. And they have it on on a case, you know, with a glass. And one time crossing, and the leader, I'm not no, I'm not going to name names. He goes, stop. And I'm like, what? She goes, have you asked Robert if you can cross? Permission. And I looked at her, are you kidding me? You know, what? Permission. You have to ask Robert permission. And I'm sorry, but well, no. Yeah. <laughs> no Ironically. No. <laughs> but you know what? To me, that was like, you're supposed to be a paranormal investigator. Okay. Right. Um, and I can understand if you want to like capture phenomena because of this doll, whatever, whatever is behind it. Mm -hmm. But there's these where they give over this control like this. It's like, OK, where is your OK? Isn't there a part of you that's saying if I'm feeding into this? In other words, I'm already coming into this as a believer. You you hit it right on the head. You hit it right on the head. Marlon. Ironically, now, <laughs> I really shouldn't say this, but Go I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big critic of TV shows. And yet, the Travel Channel has approached me to do a TV channel on curses and cursed objects. There you go. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of like, oh. and when they approached me, I, I said, well, I've never really wanted to be involved in a TV show before. Um, why would I now? And they said, well, you, we have heard a lot of things about you. You seem to come with a rational base of mind on these things. And what they want me to do is go in there and investigate cursed items like Robert the Doll and other locations around the world. Kind of like, uh, oh shoot, what's that uh, show uh, that they go around the world in search of mysteries? I can't remember offhand. Right. But it's, it's going to be like that. And I thought, and I told him, I said, I would only be interested on one, one account is that we don't go in there for entertainment value. That we go in there with actual science to back it up. I right. says, but the key issue with any cursed item is the psychology behind it. Yes. Anybody can be cursed. Somebody can be walking down the street and you accidentally uh, slap mud in their on their shoe and they're going to curse you and say, you're cursed forever. Right. Well, is that curse real or is that now just in your mind because somebody did that, excuse me, and they, they now every piece of bad luck is due You're to You're going to think that's the curse. guy that cursed me or whatever. Exactly, exactly. So you have to really look at the psychological end of it. And uh, again, that's where you have to, to, to be understanding because to that person, it's real. And that curse is real. Sure. But that is the only manifestation that's making it real. It's not the object. It's not the place. It is the mindset. The belief. Exactly. But there are certain places and certain things oh, that yeah. step outside of that boundary. And, and it, could, it could very well be an attached item. So you, you're not, somebody didn't physically take it in their hand and go, Pope Diamond, I curse you oh, for no, the Oh, no, it's just things that, that happen that are around it. It's not like a, a, a formal ceremony, I'm going to curse this thing and... You know, sometimes it's not that. And I'm going to give you, in that same trip that we did, 
they had another display. They have, a, I think, I want to say it was a Sisters of the Sacred Heart. I can't remember. There was an order of sisters that went out in Key West and established a comment and a hospital. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in there, they had a display off to one side, as a matter of fact, kind of hidden about these sisters, mm-hmm. including some of the stuff from the hospitals and all these sisters, because, you know, these sisters were like nurses, you know, when they would establish sure. from the 1800s. And I told this girl, I said, you know what, if you really want, there's more stuff going on with that stuff from those sisters from that hospital mm-hmm. than Robert yeah. the doll. <laughs> you know? right. Oh, absolutely. But because absolutely. she, it was Robert the doll. And yep. the whole focus yep. was that. And I told her, uh, I beg to differ. That stuff over there, exactly. a bunch of stuff that they got in that corner in that little room off to the side. Right, right. That stuff is got things happening with it. But oh. like you it, said, if the belief is that the that the one that's supposed to uh, be haunted or whatever is that object, right. it excludes everything else. Well, too, I look at it this way. If, if – uh, You open your mind up to that world. It's going to be more obvious. Just like we were saying, as we grow, when we're young, we believe in Santa Claus. We believe in the Easter Bunny. We believe in the Tooth Fairy and all of those elements. They're real to us. They exist. They're as practical and realistic as uh, the mailman coming to the door. But as we grow older, we distance ourselves from that. We shine away from it. And I think that is where we close it and we don't acknowledge it but if we keep that open mind we're always open to it and it will make itself known right and, and it does not have to be an either or because a lot right. of people think oh well you either believe everything or you dis- you know discount everything and it's like no you okay. can believe in it and of course have a litmus test you know like these are the things that i want to s- that that then i can go to the next step but i'm not going to say right. no absolutely not you mm-hmm. know and personally i think some of the most important discoveries in science have been done by scientists who have kept an open mind exactly, and allowed like, yeah, you know what? I'm not ready to hop on board, but I'm going to keep that door open because, and then they, sure. they're willing to go. And there's others that are like, absolutely not. And you know, they want to- I, I have interviewed a lot of scientists, doctors and so forth. And in that process, they have come to me on the side and said, we have seen things that we can't explain, but we're not allowed to talk about it oh, because yeah. our profession would be ruined. Yes. Uh, a lot of scientists at JPL that I have uh, talked with, uh, people that I know personally from JPL, say, oh, yeah, there's stuff going on on Mars. There's stuff going on on the mm-hmm. moon that we can't explain. And they'll go as far as to say, and it's not ours. Right. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. Or yes. basically doctors who have had yeah. or seen things that they don't understand in a passing, a light that emutes from the body as it travels, or several other lights that are in the area of somebody passing that can't be explained. Angelic figures, demonic figures. Yes. All of these things. But if they were to open up as a professional, they would be ruined for And that's the thing. You know, you get a lot of people, uh, you know, I've, um, you know, I belong to MUFON, and I've gone to some of the... um, meetings that they've had here and other presentations. There's another group here. And you have a lot of people that now are retired, retired mm-hmm. police sure. officers, p- retired pilots. And they'll tell you, if I would have said something when I was active, yes. that would have been the end of my career. Exactly. And it will follow you for years. It will. And what's more important at that point? Feeding your family or, of course. or They're like, trying hey, to tell you know? the truth that nobody's going to believe? And it, it's a shame because it goes back to that stigma of mm-hmm. the kooky kid, the nutty kid, because we live in this world. We, we get up in the morning. We have our coffee. We go to work. We come home. We have dinner. We watch a little TV. We go to bed. We do it again and again and again and again every single day for probably the rest of our lives. We don't want to cross that barrier and have our private, cozy little world go, disrupted. And go sideways? By ali- yeah, by aliens or ghosts or well, cryptids that are there, but they exist. They but well, there. see, the thing is that once you let that in, once it's it's like, okay, then what else do I have this, what I thought was my reality is not really the reality. Exactly. And I think a lot of people have like, hey, I just want to go home and watch Netflix when I get home from work. Yeah. And- <laughs> escape, from the, escape from that world. It, and, it's true. and what do they turn on? 
horror movies, ghost stories, yeah. UFO stories. So yep. that's the irony behind but it. But that's the thing, though, that you could turn off the TV and then, yeah, ah, that's, that yeah, was a good movie, just, man. But yeah. the good, good effects. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you hear the, the knocking on the back of the wall. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like, like did you hear that? What's that? What's that scratching? Oh, darn rats. Hope it's rats. You know? <laughs> Let me tell you, um, you know, recently I had another um, – guess that I had her name is she's an exorcist and she's out of Alabama and she's let me see some tapes that you know she just let me they, they, they're they not going to go on YouTube or anything she just allowed me to see them and she had brought in a couple of people to help out and this was a really disturbing case to be perfectly honest with you it was really really disturbing as a matter of fact I, I said I'm surprised you didn't turn around and leave I yeah. but anyway it's there was two action. guys there action. that it was their first time and I swear I was laughing because they're back there. You could tell they're helping out. But one of them, you could, you know how somebody's looking for the nearest exit? I'm thinking oh, any so minute it's now. See your fleet, yeah. yeah. And when I talked Try to, to her after she sent it to me, she goes, Marlene, the only thing I told these, told them is if you run, somebody's going to end up getting hurt. Yes. If you never want to come back and do this again, that's okay. But you can't run. You can't like bolt and leave. Right. And it's exactly like what you were saying. All of a sudden, that reality hit. I could tell by looking at their faces yeah. Yeah. that it was like their world, that they went into it thinking, oh, I'm going to get involved in an exorcism. Mm-hmm. That's going to be real cool and, you know, paranormal activity. Yeah. And their faces, when they were holding this individual down, okay, which was really difficult, by the way. Oh, I believe it. I, their I faces could, were, you could tell it was like, what am I doing here? They were exactly. truly, truly scared. Because they had that that shift, where guess what? It's not the movies. It's not the you know the 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 where you turn on the lights and the movie's over and it's okay. Well, I'm gonna go to bed and get up tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I asked her, I said, "Are they coming back?" She goes, "I don't know." <laughs> I don't know yet. It's it's the real world hits you. I hate yeah. to say it. It's not it's not ghost hunters. It's not ghost adventures. And just like you were saying, that first time that I went into that case, my whole world changed from that yes. point. And I had to make a choice from that point on. Do I proceed and continue with my interest in in trying to to discover these mysteries or do I hang it up and never approach it again? One of the things that it did allow me to do was every time I went into a alleged haunted location, I had an inputted demon alert, shall we say, Mm -hmm. for lack of better reason or or better... uh, uh, terminology, and I knew when I went into a place that I had those similar feelings and reactions to that previous case, I needed to get somebody else involved. Right. I knew at that point I did not have what it took to deal with this case. Right. And so I would go to the owners or the, uh, or the people and so on and say, this is, this is what I recommend, what, whatever your faith, whatever your comfort level is, but you need to get the clergy involved in, in some form because this is above my pay grade, so to speak. Right. This is not us walking around and getting temperature and, uh, you know, snapping some features. Yeah. This is beyond that. Exactly. And if if I led my myself or my group into something like that, then I was being irresponsible. And yeah. I was being irresponsible to the client. And, uh, again, this isn't, this isn't fun TV show, Mm-mm. turn the television off at the end of the evening. This is something that can be so dangerous. It can kill you if you yes. are not careful. Yes. Uh, so those, those warnings need to be out there. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. Well, Bottom and this is, this is one of the things, as a matter of fact, I was discussing with her. I said, you know what? A lot of people that get it, especially when they, you know, like I said, everything now is a demon, but. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with that, but you do come across those scenarios where it is something that is non-human. Okay. Well, in my encounters at this point, I've noticed an increase. Yes, in I've heard that also. That it's um, like um, that. There's an uptick in that, and there I don't is know if a it's very large one. And I don't know what it is. And ironically, Chicago is one of the leading areas for exorcisms right now. And really? with all the violence that's been taking well, place. Well, I was about to say, it could also be tied into, and exactly. like, you know, what What do they say? What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Exactly. Is it what's there that's spawning this out-of-proportion violence yes. that ends up in killing and bloodshed, you know, 
which mm-hmm. is what I would think normally that that's how it happens, where these this is actually the the catalyst behind the scenes where that people end up doing horrible things, you know. Exactly. Like, to me, I, I don't think there's anything more horrible than taking the life of another human being, you well, know. Absolutely. But in the method, in the manner. That yes, it's done, it's exactly. Horrendous. Exactly. It's, it's heinous. It's it's goes beyond that scope. And even the, the Catholic Church has stepped up in their exorcisms. And that is a rarity. Yes. That is extremely rare when the Pope gives sanction to more exorcists. Well, this is the thing, and I was I was reading back in September, you know, that the lead exorcist uh, in the Vatican died, Father Amara. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I was reading an article in a Catholic publication, by the way, sure. that was saying that one of the problems they had is as all these new priests that they were coming out did not want to do or be trained as an exorcism. Right. They were scared of it. Oh, sure. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's because there are so many cases that we are not aware of within the history of the church or churches. Uh, one of the biggest that really surprised me in so many regards was I had the honor of meeting Mother Teresa. You did? And, wow. Uh, and to meet her you know you're in the presence of a living saint. I mean, seriously. Mm -hmm. This woman is so pious, so holy. I mean, she radiated. I kid you not. There was a glow, a physical, viewable glow about this dear, sweet woman. She only stood about four foot 11. I mean, she was tiny Uh and measured, but she took up the room with her presence. And uh, I had a special blessing from her. She took my hand and... uh, and it was one of those moments in your time in your life that you just know that there is so much more in the universe than what we have. But yes. then to finally later on discover that she had had to have an exorcism. Yes, after she had that surgery. surgery. Exactly. That she was herself possessed. And that was no, that would not have been medication. That would not have been anything because Mother <laughs> Teresa would not have even wanted anything like that or, 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 or subjected herself to anything like mm-hmm. that. So there again, these elements of good versus evil are real. There yes. are forces of good. There are forces of evil. I've been in locations, places that reeked of evil. Yes. And, and it's, it could, it, it's tangible. You can yes. physically feel it. Yes. And you go into a place and you're automatically overwhelmed by the presence of good. Yes. And... If we are in eternal spirit, which I believe we are, Mm -hmm. um, then this ongoing struggle has continued from time beyond time. And it's going to until one or the other wins over in the physical. In the physical world, I was going to say. Not the physical. Yeah, the physical world could be swallowed up being a part of the processes of this eternal struggle. But I don't think one or the other on in the spiritual is, I think it's right down the middle, and it always will be. Because you have to have balance with everything in nature. And, well, and you know, and that's the thing. And you know what? I want to ask you something, Chris, because I know you mentioned earlier that you were a park ranger in the UFOs. and I keep busy. <laughs> but, you know, I had, and, and, and even with the demon things, I've even heard some, I was going to ask you first about, you know, they're saying this, that these all these disappearances of people now in the parks, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. they kind of try to tie it into abductions, UFO abductions. And I'm thinking, myself, well, could be. But then I'm thinking people wander off sometimes, especially if they're these huge state sure. parks, you know, and I've heard of people like basically they leave a trail and before you know it, they become disoriented and yep. they die, you know. Oh, it happens every day. Happens every day, but and how much? How much credence? Or <clears throat> have you heard of that? That they were saying that. Um, oh my God, I can't remember the gentleman's name right now. Who's you know his theory is that that there's some type of basically uh, abduction and of uh, all these people that go missing in all these different parks. If that were to, there was one case that I dealt with. Okay. And only one in all the years that I've been a park ranger that I can say I had to scratch my head on. And that was uh, in Colorado. And uh, while I was there, we had a report of a person, a young teenage boy, maybe about 18, 19 years old, who had 
wandered off and was missing. And they had the, the family had said that he had gone out the night before because there were strange lights in the sky, and he wanted to see what they were. Okay. Okay, well, all okay. right. Possible. Okay. You know. So, but the thing was, he, because it was snow, and it was fresh snow, there were tracks to follow. Okay. So we went ahead, we got a search and rescue team together, and we followed the tracks, and we followed the tracks into the woods, deeper and deeper, and then the tracks just ended. See, that's, that's the kind of thing that, how do you explain that, right? Exactly. Now, it's fresh snow. There's no other footprints anywhere near. Nothing. No animals. Just plain snow, except for his footprints, which came to a complete stop. And we can always tell when somebody turns around and tries to back step. Right. Their, back, go back steps. to their tracks. And this was not the case. Because when you, when you have somebody walking, they always go heel to front. Mm-hmm. Heel to front. Right. When you back up, you go toe to heel. To, to right, so so it we we can always tell what's going on in that case. In this case, it was heel to toe, heel to toe, and then nothing. And let me ask you: Did you, was he ever found? Six days later, alive. He was alive, little disoriented, little dehydrated, not really too bad. Um, to him, he had just walked off. Really, he had no recollection of the previous six days. See, that's crazy. And that's so, interesting, though. So in that case, I have to label it as very questionable, very, of uh, very probable, because all the physical evidence showed something that shouldn't be there. And the reports, the sustaining reports, him seeing lights in the sky at the campground, going out to investigate, and then six days later showing up without being, he, he was disoriented, but he wasn't. Like somebody had been out in the wilderness for six days? Yeah, it, 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 maybe a day, if that. Mm-hmm. He wasn't dehydrated. He wasn't suffering from any hypothermia. Okay. Um, so all of those cases or elements were up in the air. See, and that's the thing that you don't have an exact answer, but then you go check, check. Okay, you know, he, yeah. he's lost. He doesn't look like he's been out. All these things that you would normally apply to somebody who's been out, lost for six days. You mm-hmm. can't fake that. I mean. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because there are telltales. And a park ranger, a lot of people think, well, they just go out and la, 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 in the woods and everything yeah, else. Yogi but we're bear boo Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, boy, have I been called that many times. But we're, we're police officers. We are park yeah. police officers. We're trained in search and rescue and recovery. And so, firefight, fighting, you name it. We have a, a multi-blend of, uh, of colors to us. But this one had me completely perplexed. It had the local authorities perplexed. And to this day, it's still considered as an unknown situation, although it did end in a positive result. Right. Hopefully, hopefully. You know, again, what I haven't been able to track down what's happened since that occurrence or if yeah. the kid is okay or if he was able to carry on with his life because usually with abductions, if they're real abductions, they continue. Well, and exactly. That's what you hear, that, that, that once you're abducted, it's almost like you've, you're marked in a way, you know, you can't. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, you don't remember, but then that's when you have people that have like these, either in the dream the state, they dream things and... You know, but they, it never, you know, and some of these MUFON meetings that I've gone to that, you know, after the meeting breaks up, believe it or not, there's people that will talk to you about certain things that they wouldn't say in the general meeting right. where they suspect that they've been abducted. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of them will tell you, start when they were children sometimes. Well, and that's like with me when I had that, that yes. situation. Now, I very well, like I said, I remember putting my head to the pain in class. I, I remember everything very distinctly. It wasn't... Uh, wasn't kind of foggy or anything. I remember right. it as as a child, and it made such an imprint on me that it's still crystal clear. But when I looked down, I saw a gray. I didn't know what a gray was at and, that time, and but see, it was a gray. That's exactly that what's interesting. Up. In your mind, you weren't. It wasn't like I know what a gray is, so I'm mm-hmm. seeing what I'm expecting to see. You were looking at something, thinking, "What is that?" You know, like, "Huh?" Yeah. Yeah. I had a no child. Perceived, con- no perceived idea. But the thing is, was I abducted? I don't know. 
I've got a funny little scrape mark on my knee that I've never been able to explain. Okay. But maybe I wasn't their type. And they just said, okay. Maybe there is something that they... So, yeah, yeah do maybe you I think, didn't know. And you know what? I've heard also, I'm going to, now that we've gotten to, that, you know, we have some people that will say that if they go into that, there's more than one type of extraterrestrial involved with us, that some of them, uh, they they want to say, basically, uh, pair them up as demons. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. That, that because they don't, like we say, they, they don't see time the same way we do, or, or they're just not limited spatially the way we are, or exactly. in a dimension, uh, and that a lot of people pair them up. What do you think? Is it, are we talking two different things? I think the the alien element is is kind of a wide book. Um, throughout history, you look at some of the stories that have come across, especially like in uh, Europe with uh, Ireland, for instance, with leprechauns. Mm-hmm. Uh, could a leprechaun have been an alien? But because of their knowledge of of certain things at that time or their mythology they placed the le- the alien as a leprechaun right. or a fairy or something or an elemental of some type which exactly. would have been an explanation for this but at the same point too i think that there is everybody talks about the greats well i don't think the greys from say alpha centauri right. are the only race out there if there is other life which i do believe because yes, otherwise I, god I, god I, created I a lot well. of real estate and now with all of these exoplanets that we're discovering that are very earth like in nature mm-hmm. yes that would explain why they're able to breathe our air or maybe look like us based upon gravitational elements mm-hmm. uh, of the ev- parallel evolutionary uh, scales mm-hmm. but for instance Six and a half million years ago, had the meteor not crashed into the Earth, the predominant life form on this planet would be the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, yeah. And they would probably have become intelligent. Mm-hmm. So to say that uh, a encounter with a lizard-like reptilian right. is far-fetched, it, maybe it's not. Maybe on that planet, they evolved. Or a probability, too, that we've looked into is parallel dimensional parallel dimension. interaction. Where so that, it, in, that, in that dimension, there was no meteor strike. Exactly. And the predominant species was the reptilian. Mm-hmm. So exactly. are, we, are we encountering a parallel dimension? And that is what I think Sasquatch is, to yes. be honest with you. From yes. all of my investigations, why is it seen one moment and then gone the next? Why is there no body? We right. have physical proof that there is something out there. That cannot be explained, but we just don't have the basics. So, what better way? And and uh, the multidimensional interface, science has proven. Yes, it, it, yes, it, 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 is. It, it, it is very, very real. It could very well happen. Where two dimensions blend over into each other mm-hmm. at a certain point in, in our world, and those elements are exchanged. So, are aliens? Interdimensional could be. Are they extraterrestrial? Could be. Could be. Yeah. Uh, Bigfoot, singent from another dimension, very well could be. Yes. Reptilian, parallel universe. So all of these things. It's it's the more questions that we just we ask, and the answers that we get back just lead to more and more questions. Right. And that's where we have to live with this leap of faith in many of the things that we regard as. Uh, the truth. As, as they say in the X-Files, the truth is out there. Right. It is, but it's going to be several truths. And then we have to sit down and figure out which one best fits our world, which is dangerous. Uh, because when we start putting it all in this little box, then it's just going to blow up in our faces. Uh, and, and, and you know what? And it's like, it's also some people, and, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? There's a lot of people have had experiences just like what you said, and they never say anything about it. You know, oh. for all the people that you got that are running around that you're saying, oh, you're making this up, there's a whole segment of people that have had one or several experiences that never say anything to anybody. We've calculated only 10% of the general public come forward. Yes, and 10%. I truly believe that. Because everyone else will think that they're crazy, they don't want to talk about it, it'll go away, it's- or... Uh, so many UFO encounters, for instance. Even yes. my, myself, 
personally. I have had many, many. And I just look at it, and I don't know, maybe there's something to this, where people will look at a UFO and go, wow, that's really cool, and then go about their day like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Is there something going on where it just diffuses us from going, I got to report this, I got to let people know. Right, exactly. Because most and, people, you would think that as much as exposure as it gets in the media, if you ever actually saw one firsthand, you'd be like, oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, you just kind of stand in awe and quietness. And, like, it's just a normal thing happening. Mm-hmm. And you may talk about it after the fact, but then it's just like, oh, huh, where is that coming from? Because I know if I see an accident, I talk about it for days to, to yeah. my family. You yeah. should have seen this horrible accident or, or I had unusual. this person in the park that I had to take care of and yada, yada, yada. See a UFO, something we can't explain. Oh, hmm. Very odd. Very odd. And it's, so it makes you and, it's ex- and, and, you know, and I tell everybody, you know, like I have an aunt, she's still alive and she's a very no nonsense person. There's no such thing as ghosts and all that. That's a bunch yeah. of junk and blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, whatever. And I remember one day, you know, like, you know how the family's hanging out and they're talking about stories and she's talking about when she was a little girl, her and my mom, they were, they would go to a Catholic school with nuns where they would stay there. You know, they would. Right, boarding school. Mm -hmm. And she says she was like seven years old and she's sitting in her desk and she says she, all of a sudden she looks towards, and this was, this is very old convent school, very, very old. Mm -hmm. She says she looks towards the 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 door where the classroom and she sees a little boy dressed as an altar boy mm-hmm. and in her mind she was a little kid but she looked at him and she says that he looked really serious and really really sad plus yeah. he was totally out of place right, right okay because there was no altar boys running around where the school was that was all girls sure. by the way that part yes. was it was you know where they segregated the girls mm-hmm. And, you know, like the church was way, you know, like there's, and she says that she looked away, she looked back and he was gone. Yeah. And I think to myself, you saw a ghost, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then when, as an adult, like you said, they go into this total denial, you right. know, not only does it, she was vehemently against any of that ghost stuff that that's just, that doesn't exist. And I was like, when she told me, I said, why do you, you saw something, you saw something that a lot of people don't ever see. No. And a lot of people from that point, that could have been what triggered her to close it off because she Possibly. was so moved by it or disturbed by it that in her mind she couldn't deal with it. So what better way is to dismiss it? Even and though when is, she described it, that, she wasn't really oh, scared sure. to her. Like you said, you rationalize oh. as a kid, like, what is that altar boy doing there? And he looks like really sad and he looks like oh. something's – and then he just disappeared, you know. Oh. But And I think a lot of people – like you were saying, there's people that discount it, and then there's people that go into denial, you yeah. know. But as far as the UFO stuff, I think there are a lot of people that, despite all the exposure with the media and the news and the movies, if they mm-hmm. actually have that firsthand experience, like, okay, it's not a weather balloon. It's not a plane. Oh. It's not this. It's not that. Uh, oh, okay. Well, okay. Yeah, let's but, go eat dinner. Let's- <laughs> you know, the thing that gets me, though, is is – when we're told that it is a weather balloon or it's explainable, we accept it because mm-hmm. well, the government, the government just said it was this. Well, when you start believing the government, you're in big trouble right there. Well, yeah. it, but this is, <laughs> I, I, I also believe that psychologically there's these people that oh, this absolutely. is, they, they, for them to be okay, they need to have this structure. Oh, absolutely. And that's okay. one of the things when you research back in history through the Truman process majestic 12 and so on they literally said we cannot disclose this information primarily because it's too disturbing for people and they would not be able to function Mm -hmm. and i believe that that movies and so forth are kind of desensitizing us yes but they're always the wrong type of movie they're always the invaders they're always the bad guys now is that our way of saying be prepared or because we're a paranoid race or is it Something more is it? Uh, well, you know, you uh, I don't know. Did you recently? I think this came out like what a few months ago that Stephen Hawking's was 
saying how, you know, we needed to be careful with how we, if, you know, with acceptance of extraterrestrial intelligence, because there was a chance that, um, we might be on, on the, on the losing end of that, you know, that relationship, because obviously they would probably be superior to us in technology and knowledge and that historically people on the, on the short end of that stick, which would be us, we don't come out, you know, that in other words, we shouldn't assume from the get go that they would be kind to us for lack of a better word. Hold on. I think I might have lost him. And I'm hoping we're going to get him back. Okay, I got you back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you were saying about Stephen Hawking. Yeah, that, that, that he's that. like saying, hey, you know what? You you know, everybody is ready to say, welcome to the uh, you know, extraterrestrials, mm. but that we should be a little bit cautious about that. Oh, well, there again, are we thinking on human terms? See, that's, that's what gets me. I have heard some of the best scientists say that it is impossible – that there are extraterrestrials visiting our planet mm-hmm. because of the time lag that it would take them to get here based on science. Well, We're that's our on, understanding. That's our understanding. That's our science, not theirs. If they're millions of years more advanced, then ab- absolutely they're going to be able to do things that we yeah, are. Yeah, they've, they've like, gone beyond that. The, the, how we think of, if we're going from point A to point B, it's going to take us X amount of light years. They're... It, yeah, it's but there again is that arrogance of humanity. Yes. And I think that Stephen Hawking, although a brilliant man beyond belief, mm-hmm. is still thinking in human aspects. I am a true believer that if they wanted to do us in... Oh, they would have been a long time ago. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Just when we started coming out of the caves, they would have blown us away. Yeah. I think they're fascinated by us. I think they're curious because... We're getting to the point in our society that we're going to be going out into space eventually. Right. But are we going to be coming out as friends or foes? Right. They don't want us coming out and mucking up the neighborhood, throwing our trash around, and being bad little kids. They want us to come out and be supportive and become a greater group of, I hate to say it, united planets. Do you think our technology that... Do you think that we have gotten technology from them? Oh, absolutely. There is. There are things that we've got now that I'm scratching my head going reverse tech, alien technology. When you can put a TV that's as thin as a credit card and you can roll it up and have a picture as crystal clear as it is, okay. then somebody is really either one of the top developers in this world or somebody's doing something and it always seems to happen in spurts with us with mankind a hundred years ago it was the uh, mechanical revolution but now it, it just seems like we're making so many huge advances very very quickly and of course the military has this all ahead of us 30 years approximately ahead of us so feasibly yeah i think there are individuals that they sell patents to or patent rights down the road when they know their technology gets more advanced and we just implement it into our daily lives. And, uh, you know, the, but the only bad aspect of this, and I see it all the time because I'm a people reader. Uh, I have to be as a park ranger and a ghost investigator, paranormal investigator, is that our society has gone too far with our phones, with the technology that we have. You go anywhere anymore. Uh, I was out at dinner the other evening, and I saw this couple across from me. And they both had their phones out. They were both typing away. And every now and then, I'd see the the young man look up at the the young girl and smile and nod. And Uh go back to the keypad. And then the next thing again, she'd look up, nod, and go to the keypad. We're, we're losing our ability to communicate yes. in our socially. 
And we're relying on this anonymity of the screen or the keypad or the phone to interface with society. And I think one of the most important things for, I don't want to say normal because that's kind of subjective, but for good human emotional is connection with other human beings, real connection, Mm -hmm. not, Mm -hmm. not that, you know. I know it's easier for it's some dangerous. people. It depends. I know there's people that are extroverted. I know there's introverts. I, mm-hmm. I know that it depends. You know, some people need it in different doses. But like what you're saying, that distance that happens because, like you said, they're sitting at the same table. Right. But they might as well have been sitting by themselves. Exactly. Exactly. And I see it at schools all the time. These kids are not going out and playing or doing things mm-hmm. that, that, that are physically interconnecting with each other in sports. They're too busy on there texting their friends. And I hope we're not depending too much on our technology. But ironically enough, this technology is also opening up doorways to the paranormal world. Yes. Have you heard the reports of how many incidences of, of uh, our smartphones receiving interesting messages? Believe it or not, a few years ago, even before now, I was on a case where the claim was that the grandmother had passed away they had one she had one they had one child one grandson mm-hmm. she was communicating to him through a phone that was disconnected yes okay and when i when the, i first got contact i was like oh okay all yeah. right let's see let's you know is i was the one that did the pre-interview with the family and everything and I was like, this is really unusual because I was like, okay, somebody here might not bite me off their meds, I think. You know, it was it was like I couldn't it was like the telephone. You know, even though I've heard, you know, of communications and everything. Sure. It was like it's grandma and the cell phone. To me it was like very but then I've now, like you said, it's more common when you hear right. that there is that that that's the bridge sometimes for communication from the other side. I had a Personally, I had a strange incident occur on the anniversary of the death of my mother. Okay. Now, my phone is a uh, uh, Samsung, uh, so it's it's a pretty good phone next to the iPhone. But uh, my mother knows I love cats. I, I love I, I I love all animals, but cats always are more whimsical than dogs to me, and so. So I was at work, and I was texting uh, one of my uh, fellow park rangers, and the keypad started meowing <laughs> at me. So every button I pushed, meow, 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 and I'm going, what the heck is this? Did somebody I change my key? I, and I'm going, what? I looked at my phone like, what are you doing? I you're not supposed to do that. But then I started thinking about it. My mother, if she was trying to send me a signal, that would sure be it. Okay. And because she, like I said, she knew I had a, a definitive love for cats. So I started putting the pieces together. But I went into the the uh, the settings. I could not find anything. Like yeah, did somebody that like they sc- change my my tones, my ringtones, or something my, to a cat? Yes. Yeah, and there was no sound bit. There was nothing in there that would be connected to the keypad. I think that's and then great. about an hour later, it stopped. So it was like, okay, this is one of those, you try to rationalize everything. And then when you just kind of step back from it and you kind of look at it, well, it's the anniversary of mom's death. She knows I love cats. What kind of a message And the only one that was going to get that would have been you. Would have been me, Exactly. And I mean, I get, I have strange things happen to me all the time, Marlene. I, here's one I still can't figure out, and it, it really kind of blew me away real quick. Um, I went to Walmart. That's a scary enough place as it is, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I went there to get a pair of shoes. Okay. And, you know, if you go into Walmart, their shoe section, it's not that their shoes are all in boxes. Usually, their real cheap shoes are on mm-hmm. strings all gathered together. Right, And so I was looking at this pair, that pair, the other pair, and I finally came across a pair that was like two behind a set there. Picked it out, right size, right shape, everything. Bought okay. it, 
brought it home. Well, the next day I was getting ready to put them on and I stuck my foot in the, uh, in the shoe and I couldn't put the shoe on. Something was stuck. It was sticking in it. And I thought, what the heck? So I was thinking, you know, how some people put paper in shoes. Right, yeah. Um, I still don't know why, but they do. And so I went ahead and I pulled out, of all things, a wad of money. Wow. I mean, a huge, huge roll of money. <laughs> and it was in a rubber band, but uh-huh. then, but I opened it up and it was all in Chinese. And it said, the Bank of Heaven on it. Okay. And it, it, it was very nicely printed. I still have it. And I was going, what the heck is this? Well, I'd never heard of anything like this. So I started, I got on, on uh, the internet to try and find out what is this money. Uh-huh. And so I look it up and I find out that it's, the Chinese use it for the dead. Oh, like a gift for the dead kind of deal? Exactly, a gift for the dead. Oh. And, it's, <laughs> and I'm reading this, and I kind of got a shiver up my spine because it's like there are 60, 60 $20 bills all wrapped up together in this roll with a rubber band around it, and it's in this particular set of shoes that I purchased. Okay. Now, I mean, it, it, very oddly enough, it coincidental with which I believe it is, but you start to think, why would somebody put that in a shoe, number one? Yes. And number two, ironically, a parapsychologist would be the one I to know. find What it. are the chances? What are the odds? It, 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 it just it was like, okay, somebody's trying to send me a message here. Yes. I know yes. they are. Yes. Because it, it's like, and, and the, uh, the store that I was at is not heavily populated by Asians. It, it's it's strongly Caucasian. And well, so, I was about to say, was, was it manufactured in China? But then, even if that was the case, let's say that well, was. It, still, I the mean. The chances of you me personally being the it. one to purchase that pair of shoes. Yeah. Money for the dead. I mean, <laughs> of, of, okay. And because uh, you were also, you were the type of person that actually went and found out, what does this mean? Yes. Yeah, because it, 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 it just, there was such an uneasiness about it when I discovered it. I thought, why? And I looked online, and these things go for like a couple bucks each. Mm-hmm. So they're not just like you go to a, a, a Chinese dinner store and right. able and to it, pick up free money. Yeah. It's it you know, like, paper yeah, they put funny. it like they stuffed it in there, and it really didn't yeah. mean anything. So I, I have no idea if they, they were made in China, where they did the person want to protect the money by putting in a shoe from the boss, or gosh, only knows. But ironically, the whole string of events. And I don't believe in uh, coincidence. I never have. No. Being in the paranormal field, you discover very quickly no. that there is no such thing as coincidence. Really. There is there Things kind of line up for you. And uh, I, I just I found it very amusing to come across something like that. And I'm I, 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 I really like you said, you know, synchronicity, coincidences. Sometimes it's like all you have to do is just observe a little bit. And sometimes there's a message in there. Mm-hmm. But like you said, mm-hmm. sometimes people get carried away. They're too busy. It's like, right. ah, forget it. You know, uh, yeah, it's like, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, absolutely. My, my dear mother, she, uh, in addition to that story of, uh, of, of the uh, cat sounds. <laughs> I think that's such a good um, story. <laughs> she, uh, when she was alive, she was a big, big uh, fan of scratch lottery tickets. Okay. And she would always find pennies on the ground. Mm-hmm. And she'd always pick them up and she'd say, penny, penny, pick me up and all the day I'll have good luck. And then she'd use them, scratch uh-huh. her little lottery tickets off with. Now, Mama was so happy. She was going to be turning 80 and she was just shy of turning 80 when she passed away from a massive, massive heart attack. And But after her death, pennies started showing up in places that they shouldn't have been in. Right, exactly. And, and that, I always knew that was Mama's way of saying, hey, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm all doing right. okay. Not to worry. And, uh, I mean, you'd look at, at something on the couch and then turn turn front for a few seconds and then turn back and there'd be a penny or a couple pennies. Yes. And, and, and it's very uh, subtle. Very. But, but it's very obvious. Yes, exactly. Like once you can say maybe twice, but by the third time you're like, okay, yeah, there's something here to the this. Time. And it's, you know, uh, it's up to me to 
interpret it to read it but if you exactly you see it for what it is you know it, and again some people like especially when they're trying that communication with family mm-hmm. members they want this big production you know and, and I it's say, not going to happen and it's not going to happen that way it's no, not and, and they're able to only do so much in the physical world yes they can they're very they're, limited exactly it's not in and even their interaction from their perception of us is very different What I think is that once you have a spirit that is not tied to this earth plane, in other words, what's a ghost or a discarnate, that they've gone, their ability to to communicate, since they're really not out here all the time, you know what I'm saying? They might just be coming by to say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Their ability to communicate and to influence this plane Mm -hmm. is very, very difficult for them. Absolutely. They need energy, and that's why... Batteries are drained. That's why our ener- our personal energies are drained. That's why occurrences with electricity in houses flicker and turn well, on. I think that Wait sometimes me. that's why they limit, like I said, the ones that are not stuck here are the ones yeah. that say, I'm going to go by on an anniversary or, you know, on a certain date. Exactly. You exactly. know, uh, and, and like I say to people, believe it or not, you know, once you, in my personal opinion, my belief is that once you attain that level of enlightenment that you've actually gone, mm-hmm. you realize you got to let this living person work it out. You exactly. know, now is their time, you yeah. know, that whether it's because you can see ahead of the curve, but you mm-hmm. realize you understand I'm not going to hang out here. Even if this yeah. is the person I love, they got to work it out, whatever it is that they're doing. Oh, absolutely. And that's it. Absolutely. Some people want like this deceased relative or whatever to be there holding their hand. They want and, what they had in life. Right. All the way. And it's like, it. that's that's not what you, you don't want it for yourself. And right. you definitely wouldn't want that for somebody that's passed away because that's it. You don't have a human body anymore. You're you're off to other adventures as far as I'm concerned. Um, and one of the things, Chris, I wanted to ask you because I was reading it sure. and I just remembered it. Uh-huh. You described this to me was so scary. One of the entities, okay, on the Queen Mary was Fedora Dude. Hello, yes. oh my God, oh. <laughs> Fedora Dude. Okay, there this are... first of all, describe Fedora Dude because when I was a re- when I was reading, that, I was like, I would have hightailed it <laughs> at least for that night. I would have said, I'm out of here. <laughs> Fedora Dude is one of the, the many ones that are very active on the Queen Mary. Really? And a lot of people see him. But he's a very menacing type of individual. Uh, okay. he, he wears this fedora, usually stands over in a corner, uh, pretty much solid okay. for most parts. And uh, he'll just stand there and glare at you most of the time. And you walk by and he kind of emits this this really kind of negative, like, I'm evaluating you and watching you and okay. and uh, you just better be on your guard type. Because on the Queen Mary, there are the majority of the entities that are there are very, very, very sweet, kind. They're just trying to relive Well, you know what I thought was really lives. interested was that you described them in a zoot suit. Okay. He was in a zoot suit, yeah. And, and it, this kind of like out of the – well, if you go back and you look at, at – uh, the time frames of Los Angeles in particular. Well, that's what I was about to say. The zoot suits were something that was found more in Southern California. Exactly, exactly. And he, we're thinking that he possibly could have been in that time period. But, now there's two, two rules of thumb here that we're thinking. Uh, one is that he could have been drafted into the military. Okay. And he could have died on the ship itself. Okay. In transit, because the Queen Mary was a troop carrier Mm -hmm. during the war. And, I mean, she carried more troops than any other ship uh, across the Atlantic. And uh, during that time, she was called the Grey Ghost because she was completely... Right, exactly, she was. But Hitler put a bounty on her and everything. But a lot of of the military did die because of the conditions on the ship. And so we are kind of thinking, well, most entities will project themselves in a manner that they felt most comfortable with in life. Right, and can exactly. And identified with. So is this the time period where he himself felt most comfortable, or did he die in Hollywood and is a transient spirit, 
and discovered the Queen Mary along with all of her other spirits on board and just took up residence. Well, because from what I understand is, and I don't, but the people that wore the zoot suit, it wasn't only the suit, it was the lifestyle as well. It was, it was a whole, you know, thing. Mm-hmm. You did, just didn't wear that suit, let's say, on one day oh, on a oh. Sunday. You, it was the lifestyle of... Oh, well, it, and it was deemed inappropriate. Yeah, it was. And so that, again, that's what, that's what the, the two elements are, is realistically, he shouldn't be on the ship. Well, I was thinking picture. that's exactly... My first thought when I read that was, this guy is a stowaway. <laughs> he yeah, got on so- there because... He's got all this activity going on, and he was maybe something happened to him close by. Maybe he met his end close by. And that's why we're thinking maybe in Hollywood or, or Long Beach itself, because it all the 40s were very active during that time. And basically, the, the zoot suit was a protest to mm-hmm. the time of what was happening. Yes, it was. And it, it was a banner to them, and they were very proud. And again, so is he a transient spirit? Was he drafted and then put into the military, or was he a stowaway, like you're saying, that was trying to get from the U.S. to to uh, Europe? Uh, or, or, or it could or have been something. anything. But it could have been. And now we just you, don't know because he won't communicate with us, really. Now you it's said this is the like part that like, got to me about it when you saying that he has yellow eyes and yellow teeth. I was like, oh yeah, crap! Yeah, yeah, he's not a very approachable, <laughs> I mean, like, very friendly you see the eyes first i have to admit it's kind of like one of those cartoons where they turn the lights off and all you see are the white white eyes and the the smiling teeth it was kind of like that and and that was the the scary part about it but a lot of people look at him and they think he's an actor right because of his the way he's dressed right the way he's dressed and the way he's looked looks like and uh you know in fact uh during halloween they have a uh a haunted village there at the Queen Mary. It's an amusement type thing. Okay. So they've got haunted houses. In fact, they even open up the boiler room area for bands because okay. all the boilers have been taken out. Well, that's out. right. The boiler room is where they've had the that door that crushed the... Yeah, yeah. door number 13, watertight door number 13. Right. But there's this huge cavernous area adjacent to that. And so they are able to put on these live performances and, and do all these things. But a lot of people thought that that was part of that event when in okay. reality it wasn't and uh it it's it's it, people again they want to look for the the explanation that in a practical means was that an actor was that i just saw this person standing there and they looked like something from your halloween deal yeah and you're like how what did it look like <laughs> yeah what are you talking about or even the captain when the captain shows up one of the, uh, the one of the first captains uh shows up and starts to talk to people on board and people go and comment on how realistic he was and how informative he was and, <laughs> yes. and the and the and the staff will go the tour guide was great do what say what and they'll go we don't have anybody like that can you and, imagine and this happened it happened to me believe it or not really um I was actually living in uh, in Colorado at the time, and I and my son, I brought my son out uh, to see where I grew up here in Long Beach, and we stayed on the Queen Mary. And when we arrived, it was about eleven o'clock at night. And when you go to the ship, you have to check in at the bottom of of the ship, and there's an elevator that takes you up to the different regions of the of the ship itself, and so. I checked in with the uh, the individual that was there, and they wear period costumes. Okay. And uh, there was nobody else around us, and uh, so nicest guy, nicest guy in the world. And uh, I, I kind of was joking with him about the ghosts, and he says, "Oh yes, Queen Mary is definitely, uh, definitely filled with ghosts." And uh, so I was telling him, I says, "Now I know that the uh, uh, the swimming pool is closed." But is there a way to get into the swimming pool? And he looked at me and he said, well, if I were not to go down deck such and such, deck uh-huh. deep, and if I got to a door, I would not go open that. I would not open that door and I would not walk down five flights of stairs and open up another door. 
and go in to that door. So he told me literally how to go. Yeah. To <laughs> so it was great. He was really informative and all. And, and so uh, I and my son, he, he got us to our room and uh, uh, we went to bed and spent some time. And then there's other stories I could tell you. But uh, when we were checking out, I went to the front counter and I said, I'd really like to thank the young man that helped me out the other night. And uh, so the guy asked me, well, what did he look like? I have to, you know, did you get a name? And I, I said, I think his name was Mike. And so uh, I started to describe Mike. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and you know, they, they, when they're not faking it, right? <laughs> no, he wasn't faking it at all. I, he says, sir, we don't have a Mike fitting that description. I says, what? He says, we have nobody on staff that looks like the individual you're trying to describe. I says, you're, you're pulling my leg, right? And he says, no, sir. We do not have anybody by that description. Wow. And I thought, okay, well, there you go. There, Sometimes <laughs> they pulled one on me. And- they pulled one on me. And the thing is about the Queen Mary is it is so energized that I've described this a couple times, and I really, truly believe it. That ship has been sitting there since the uh, late 60s. It has had a lot of people on board. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of spirit energy through the years. We're we're looking at almost 100 years. It'll be uh, 100 in uh, the 2030s. But during that time, that ship has suffered, has gone through so many elements oh. uh, life and death and years of, of service and years of romance and love and tragedy oh yeah drama a lot exactly. of emotional and absolutely that I really truly believe that the ship itself is sentient in many ways not on the sense of like us but right aware, self-aware through all of the spirit activity that's on there that energy had to have imprinted something into the ship itself. Yes. Because when you touch it, when you walk along it, there's a vibration, a strange vibration that emanates that really shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. And this, you can just tangibly feel this energy everywhere you go. And I think that's also what draws the spirits. Yes. That in and, and of itself, it's like... Exactly. And there is... There's just this omnipresence when you walk aboard that ship that I've never, ever encountered on any other vessel before or since. And that's what makes the Queen Mary very, very special to me um, as a researcher because I'm discovering things about her that she's allowing me to discover that may be far-fetched in many areas, Mm -hmm. but... If we're talking about the things that we talk about, we're looking at things that we cannot explain. We don't have all the answers. And that's the one thing that I always get about is there are no experts in this field. Oh, there no. can't be. There Whoever can't says they're an expert, it's like, I got news for you. You don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Exactly. You cannot be. You can be educated. You can yeah. discover diverse theory and theorem and propose outlandish uh, research ideas or practical ideas. But the thing is, we're never, ever going to understand this until it occurs to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we'll understand what the mechanics are about it. But you can't use the same physics of this world in the spiritual world, in extraterrestrial life, in cryptid elements, in all of the other sciences that we know that are practically real because they're tangible. But Let me ask you something, Chris. Since you've been so many times on the ship, have you ever found yourself in a menacing situation with something that you've come across there? Nothing negative. Okay. Nothing negative. I have come across elements of severe sadness. Okay. Elements of severe joy. Okay. Uh, happiness. Uh, curiosity. Is a okay. big one. Um, a little bit of promiscuity sometimes. I've been sure. pinched, and uh, um, you I've know had what? I'm sure that when it was going back and forth, you know, the thing that that the people say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I'm sure there was a yeah. lot of people that it was oh, happens yeah. on the Queen Mary stays on the well, Queen Mary. You know, so yeah. absolutely. 
like that old TV show, The Love Boat. Well, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh-huh, exactly. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, they, they, everything that we carried in life is stored in that ship to some degree. Now, whether it is intelligent or imprinted, I think it's a combination of both. Okay. But it is a microcosm, a, a fantastic research facility for the paranormal because it is any everything that you could dream of in the quote-unquote haunted realm exists there. Well, it sounds like it's almost like a smorgasbord. You know, I imagine you can just go through all these different areas and levels and floors and you're going to find... Exactly, exactly. And it just uh, is, every time I go aboard the Queen Mary, you go back in time. You really do. Because, well, because you were saying that it hasn't really changed that much. It's it hasn't. Yet. It hasn't. It, everything is still in Art Deco. Everything is still wood paneled. All the furniture is still the same. You really feel that presence of what it was like to go and travel during the transatlantic period. Now, today there are bigger and greater ships, cruise ships out there that are magnificent. Her her replacement, the Queen Mary II, is a marvel to behold. Okay. She doesn't have, quote unquote, the spirit of the original Queen Mary. Well, I think that also, like you said, it was used for so many things that normally no cruise ship nowadays has ever gone. You know, it was... It transported soldiers. Mm-hmm. It was in the middle of basically crossing the Atlantic at, during wartime. So many things that no cruise ship that's oh, floating not. around right now ever experienced. No. that it, You can't duplicate that. Well, you know? the other thing, too, is that the Queen Mary in itself, in, the, in that day, you had to interact with people. You had to, to sit and you'd go to the bar at the the lounge at the head of the ship, or you would socialize on the deck and play te- deck tennis, or go to you know dinner and interact with, with people there. On these new cruise ships, you've got swimming pools, you've got oh, yeah. water slides, you've got amusement park rides, you've got shopping centers. They're not ships, they're, they're cities, yes. they're it's floating like- cities. And you it's don't almost like, okay, I'm going to do the exact same things that I did while I was on land. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to turn on the light. I notice I'm getting a little dark sure. in the face, so if I kind of jump up and down. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I know what there that means. I know that lighting sometimes, like, you, you don't realize it's diminishing. <laughs> there we go. Let oh, me ask you, I know okay. that, 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 that Peter James was, yes, that I you mentioned that, he, that you visited, and I have seen shows where he was on there. And I'm sure he must have been like, he probably was, didn't know which way to look. He must have been like, there's everything here. Peter was a remarkable man. When I was a teenager, like I told you, I used to sneak up board the Queen Mary. Okay. Officially and unofficially. I knew all the back like, ways right. in that, that I could get out. I studied that ship to the very detail. I had the blueprints. So I knew exactly where I could go and where I could go where no one else could go. Mm-hmm. And on one of these occasions, I was about 17, 17, 18, right around there. I'd gone in one of these areas that you're not supposed to go. Okay. And I turn around a corner, and there's this man standing there. And he's just kind of looking around. I had this bright, bright white hair and this okay. really dark mustache. Uh huh. And I stopped dead in my tracks. And I go, oh, crap, I'm caught. Busted. And because uh, I didn't know who it was. And so he looks at me and he has this puzzled look on his face. And I'm looking at him with this puzzled look on my face. And he says, what are you doing here? And I said, I just am looking. <laughs> he said, really? You're not supposed to be here. And I said, I know. I just love the ship. And I'm always, and this was the opening line. I says, I'm, I'm looking for ghosts. And right then and there, that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship. And wow. uh, he started talking to me, he introduced himself as Peter James, and I, mean, I didn't know who Peter James was. And uh, so he started showing me things, areas of the ship. And uh, he would call out to his favorite spirit, Jackie. Okay. And we were in the pool area, 
and he had free reign of the ship. I mean, he could go anywhere he wanted. Okay. And uh, so I tagged along with him, and so we got to the, to the pool, and he calls out Jackie, and Jackie responded. Wow. Jackie would always respond to him, and it's this little girl, um, still not sure what was the cause or why she's there, okay. uh, but it, it he had a really definitive connection with her, and she with him. Okay. But she's confused. She's looking for her mommy. She's she she always is looking for her mommy. And there's another protective spirit there with her, an older spirit, but it's not her mother. And uh, but that was the first time I ever heard a, a spirit respond, and you could actually hear it, like it was a, a real individual with the uh-huh. echo, the echo of the pool. And later on is when they did the sighting show on the TV show. Right. Exactly. And, and then he became a predominant uh, character in sightings. And in fact, they did mm-hmm. a tour with him on, uh, on the ship where he called out to Jackie and she responded. But Peter and I remained friends in, up until his death. And, uh, but just a very humble, very sweet man, um, but uh, very gifted. Okay. And uh, I think in many ways he was underutilized and underappreciated for his abilities. And people thought it was a trick, that you know, none of this was real, and it was all staged. But right. with Peter, it, it was very real. It was very real with him. You know what? And, you know, and, and that's the thing that, um, because, see, he was around before the advent of all this, you know, the reality TV thing, where right. back towards the end of the 90s was when they started doing like I said, sightings and the X Files, you know, that started like getting a exactly. little bit more mainstream in the sense of mm-hmm. Hollywood. Exactly, and that was one of the predominant shows that and Unsolved Mysteries. Yes, were the two and TV Mysteries. shows. Yes, on NBC, and uh, those two shows were the predominant introduction into the paranormal world as we know it. Right, and and even then, you know, and it, you know, and I think that that's. Um, but even then, it was still okay. You know what I'm saying? Because they would present mm-hmm. things as they knew it. Right. You know, right. it, but it wasn't over the top stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> it wasn't over sensationalized as they've done it now. And it, again, people are going to believe what they see on TV. They're going to oh, believe yes. what they, You'd they be did. surprised. Some of, well, it wouldn't Everything be on, on TV if internet. it wasn't true. It's like. Oh, absolutely. Uh, on the internet. Or if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. And I was like, no. No, every, it, it, we have to be real in our real world approach. And. It all falls back into how much time you want to invest invest into this. How much of your life do you want it to consume? Because it will. Yes. Um, you're going to be looked at as somebody that is either reputable or unreputable. Yes. And uh, it just depends on the reasons that you're doing it and your devotion and your your enthusiasm for it. Mm-hmm. Because it it does it does take up a lot of time that I don't think there are any real paranormal investigators out there that are getting paid for this. And if they should, they should be slapped. No, uh, there's there. You know, it's, it, to me, when I teach classes on the side um, from my college classes, uh, we, we do teach courses on how to do paranormal investigations. If you look mm-hmm. on my website, you can see that. And that's how we generate money for equipment and for gas and for things like that. Right. But if somebody needs help, how exactly. dare you charge for that? Of course. If you have the gift, if you have the ability to help somebody in this world, you should do it. If you One of two a- things is going to happen. Either you're going to go out and you're going to go, there's nothing wrong here, supernatural. You, you know, no. you might have somebody's cuckoo. That happens. That happens. Absolutely. And people don't realize that you do have a segment of people that claim things. Mm-hmm. And then when you meet them, they they there could be mental illness. There could be a lot of other things that have nothing whatsoever to do with the paranormal and supernatural. Right, and, right. you know, if you're a paranormal team that's got some type of ethics, you back out, you know. Exactly. You yeah. don't go through and feed into the, the this belief that they think that right. they've got something going on. You know, usually a, the team leader somehow right. looks at this thing and says, okay, you know, I got to gracefully withdraw from this. But not everything thing is going to be a supernatural or paranormal you know scenario it, is, it isn't 
It isn't. And, th- and I think this is one of the problems that we're just starting to see now that's been a big thing over in Europe is the, the charging of individuals to go on ghost hunts at certain locations. Oh. Uh, you see that a lot over in Europe where they're right. going to leap the Lep Castle and they're doing an investigation. You pay $200 to go on this adventure with them and, uh, you know, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, uh, I mean, uh, if you want to go there and it's the historical significance, but it's like, okay, do you know what the chances are that? Unless something is being staged. Oh, well, that's and a whole different that thing about. where we're we're crossing the line right there. And this is starting to show up that there are groups out there that are staging certain things Mm -hmm. in order to look credible and in order to continue with this business. Well, no, what's going to happen is if let's, let's face it, you go to one of these things and even if you paid X amount, but you walk away with this experience, you're going to tell everybody and you know, Oh my God. And then, and I saw, or I felt or whatever. And, then yep. everybody's going to line up thinking, oh, I want to have my own paranormal experience. Exactly. We've turned the paranormal science into an amusement park. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And, and any entity is not going to have anything to do with that. Oh, I can no. guarantee it. Because no. they're, they're, it's not like they're, oh, they're intelligent. They're just as intelligent as yes. they were in life. And they're going to know when they're being bamboozled. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're not going to want to go ahead and... and uh, well, like Before. I said, most of my, if you know, if you especially if you've got a group of people, you know, oh. they're not really investigators. That it's like, okay, nine times out of ten, if there is any intelligent haunting or entity yep. there, they hightail it somewhere yeah. under the rafters yeah. or somewhere. Yeah, and, and it's like it, let's let's wait for those people to leave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I mean, people, if you're going to try and do something, do it from the historical aspect. Don't yes. do it from a entertainment yeah. aspect and i'm starting to see it here in the u.s now i'm, I'm in it's like oh gosh i hope we don't aren't going down this road because yes. nothing will destroy the credibility quicker than that kind of a mindset well no what happens is that like you said the media and then everybody everybody gets put into the same yeah. group yeah you know so are you true. you know and, I, and i'm going to give you an example even though when when they had the advent of spiritualism okay exactly mm-hmm that it swept the nation and everybody. And then, you know, of course, you had a lot of people that were like, they were like totally fakes. You know what I'm saying? Sure. They're manifesting sure. all this ectoplasm, like from mm-hmm. every orifice. And it's like, come on. Yeah. But I do believe that there were legitimate psychics. Oh, okay? sure there are. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because it, were, has, it has to start somewhere. Right. But, of course, you know, even though a lot of people, you know, they say because of, the thing of the civil war and you had so many people had lost loved ones. Absolutely. In the war, you know, and that's why it also took off it the way it did, you know, but you know, I do think that, that amongst, yeah, that there were people out. Number one, I think that if you're a psychic, the same thing as supernatural, a psychic cannot do things on demand. I think no, it's physically exactly. and mentally exhausting that you're going to do every day. You're going to be, Communicating with the dead and manifesting. Uh, back then, you know, they would do that ectoplasm coming out of their mouth and their right. ear. And their. Right. I, I don't see how physically any a human being, if you were truly psychic, could do that day after day. So oh, if, no. even if you were a real one, you maybe got to the point where you were faking it a lot of times. Exactly. Okay? exactly. Then you had the out and out fakes. Mm-hmm. But amongst those, you really had legitimate psychics that had the, you know, ability to either hear or you know com- that communication that go between but you know now a lot of people look back at that whole era of spiritualism and go oh that was so much that was so hokey and all that yeah. and it's like i think a lot of really true psychics did exist you know that were part of the spiritualism movement i think we all have the ability mm-hmm. to to encompass that because i think that's the next part of our evolution yes uh it because again, we're part spirit as it is, plus yes. we're part human as yes. it is. We live symbiotically together with this flesh and spirit. And those abilities within our spirit interact with our physical, but to what degree? And that is, I think some people are discovered. Our brain, for instance, why was our brain created the way it is when we only use a quarter of its potential? Yes. Uh, there's something on the evolutionary aspect that 
is lying dormant in that area. And I think we still need to learn how to tap into that, which inevitably we may. But I believe that ability to foresee, to communicate telepathically, to communicate uh, in ways that we don't even understand yet uh, is there. It's just we've got to learn how to tap well, into it. Know. And some of them already have. And it's sometimes it's just even simple intuition. It doesn't even have mm-hmm. to be like that you're communicating with the dead. Oh, absolutely. Well, how many times have you gone down a street and thought, I go this way every single day, but today I'm going to go mm-hmm. left, and then later find out there was a horrible traffic accident right. that occurred on that street. Yes. What was it that told you to go the other way when right. you normally wouldn't? Exactly. So we need to play into those hunches. When that little voice in the back of our head tells us or makes us feel uncomfortable with something, we need to listen to it. There's Even something more. Even if it's not logical. And I think that's the problem exactly. for a lot of people. That when it's not logical, it dismiss it like it's my imagination. I feel stupid. You know, what am I going to... Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, you know, there's moments... Um, as a matter of fact, there's a book. It's it's, uh, it's called The Gift of Fear. Mm-hmm. And, oh my God, I can't remember the guy's name. I think he was an FBI profiler, if I remember correctly. Right. Right. And he basically describes how people... Um, that have found themselves in scenarios where they were in danger, discounted their feelings of fear because they thought it was their imagination. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then horrible things happened to them, you know, and that, Mm -hmm. you know, but they survived obviously because they were able to tell the story. But a lot of them described where prior to this, they kept having these feelings or these thoughts like, you know, like that they felt fear. You know, that's why the book is titled The Gift of Fear Mm -hmm. because – and the reason why I say that is that's part of the intuition that it doesn't follow logic, but there's something no. in our brains that tells us there's either something around me, maybe I can't see it, mm-hmm. that I need to leave, like right now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Or that perception. How many times you feel somebody staring at you mm-hmm. and you yes. know what they're doing? What is that energy? Where is that coming from? Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody following you. You could be still 20, 30 steps ahead of them, but yet at the same point, you know you're being followed. Yes. Those are all in depth parts of our brain mm-hmm. that we just don't normally use, but are there. Now, could it be the animal part of us? It could be, but I think there's much more involved. I think that, uh, you know, some people call it the guardian angel or, or the consciousness be, or whatever. It could be, it could be a, a multiple. Of- anything it could be it could be a little bit of everything depending also on the situation sure you know but again i think that for all our logic and the science and everything which is wonderful i mm-hmm. absolutely i'm 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 an analytical person but we we can't sacrifice everything yeah. on the altar of science and you know hard and fast you know proof and you know if i can't quantify it then forget it it doesn't exist because right. I think that's a big mistake, and I think that's, mm-hmm. you know, where a lot of, um, how can I tell you, it's like that they, they want to put everything, like, let's say, like you said, like parapsychology yeah. or ESP yeah. or psychic or ghost, or it's like, oh, it's either either you're, forget it, or, oh, that you're like, oh, you're one of those, and it's like, no, you know, you can believe in this and mm-hmm. still want to have proof or capture evidence under certain circumstances, and you know, I myself, I tell everybody, I'm very skeptical when somebody brings me something or says something. Sure. I'm, very, I'm, I'm probably more skeptical than a lot of other people out there because I have experienced firsthand real stuff. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that is what makes us different from, I hate to use the term, but armchair ghost hunter. Yes. Uh, we've been around the block a few times. We've, we've experimented in areas yes. that they have yet to even conceive of. But we aren't claiming we know the answers we're claiming that based upon our experience our conclusion is based on x y and z from that experience and that previous knowledge there may be something down the road that we've yet to discover and the only way we're going to discover that is by making that leap of faith we evolve by making those leaps of faith and that Mm -hmm. is how we as a group will succeed and that is how parapsychology will become a norm of the sciences. Yes, because exactly. Because we come to it with a professional standing consciousness that have the facts and we're credible in our nature and in our research and in our work. Uh, somebody who comes with a grainy picture with 
leaves in the background that are saying it's the it ghost of so and so. That's not credible. No, the, the and, and you know what? And, and this is what I tell them. You know, it might be a real picture. Unfortunately, the proof yeah. is not that good. It's no, it's not. It, 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 in, in today's world, you, if it's too good, it's it's questioned. If it's shady or or color is off or or any of that, it's no good. I don't know if any of the of the the mechanics we have today are really ever going to be able to stand under scrutiny. But there are those elements or there is that evidence out there that you just cannot argue with there is too much and of course but you're always going to have your skeptics and you're always going to have your believers but the ones that we need to know is is the fact that if we can get science backing us a little bit more than what they're doing Mm -hmm. part of the battle will be solved right there and uh, again we're never going to be able to approve anything until basically an alien Walks up to the president and, and it's like, well, it's from worldwide. Well, I guess there were extraterrestrials all along. It's like, yeah, I guess oh. there was. Okay, problem solved. Let's move on to the next problem. But you know, those are the things that are going to have to take place. Or you know, I, regretfully, I hate to say it, somebody shoots a Bigfoot and brings the the body in. I would hate to see that because right. if these are intelligent creatures, then to me, that's nothing less than murder. But or even with an alien. The same thing. Uh, these are intelligent beings, to the best of our knowledge. And respect is earned by showing respect. And I think a lot of the reasons why we don't have UFOs landing on the, the White House lawn is because, what would be the first response? The military. And and you know what? And it, Sometimes I even laugh because... With all of those things that you said, Chris, whether it's the UFOs or the Bigfoot or whatever, there's going to be a fake. They're faking it, you know. Like we never went to the moon, or you know, they'll, they'll be like, "Oh, that's you know what? That's not real." <laughs> there are people still out there who think we're living on a flat world. I mean, come yeah, on, exactly. People, yeah, you're entitled to your opinion, and, and yes. I respect your opinions, but the science proves you're wrong. <laughs> Like the horizon, like have you seen something that goes slowly, doesn't like fall off? I know. But I, exactly. what I'm saying is there's always going to be a portion, especially like you said, because nowadays they can fake so many things. That I think that if ever, anybody, like you said, they shoot a Bigfoot, which by the way, I, recently, I don't know if you saw that one that they proved they took, he's a, one of the guys, I think it was out in California or Northern California, he had said he had shot a Bigfoot, but he didn't keep the corpse, and but he yeah. had some hair, and there's yeah. a geneticist out of England, I think one of the major universities. And he says, look, you bring me any material and I will test it to yeah. see what it's made of. Yeah. And uh, I think that that guy that went to see him, which by the way, I think he must be one of the most hated men. It was one of those, like, this is not a bright idea for you to say you were the one that killed the Bigfoot. But anyway. Right. He and took- there again, that's, that's a curious thing is if he killed the darn thing and it's such a big thing as it is, why wouldn't he have kept the body? Well, he said the if if I remember correctly, it was he he killed um, not a full grown one, he killed like mm. a youngster, oh, yeah. and he, the, it, the it, he, when he went back to get the body, it wasn't there. And bottom line, I think he had kept either some blood and some hair that had stuck to his mm-hmm. boot. One of those deals. Okay. Uh, okay. They sent it off to and this guy Tess. I, I want to say I think he either came back wolf or bear. One of those things. And I think to myself, you're such an idiot. <laughs> Because I think that there must be a bounty on your head for those people out there that take sure. it seriously because you killed Bigfoot. Not only exactly. a Bigfoot, a young Bigfoot. Yeah, that's like killing a little child. In, right. In like, can people. you think of any other way to th- try to be famous? I mean, when I was looking at the show, I said, you know what? I really like this because there's somebody's actually this guy in England who's, you know, he's willing, he's a very serious scientist to say, bring me the material and I will test it. I'm the first one sure. that wants to find proof right. of a primate or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you know, and so forth. He's tested a bunch of them, but he's, I, I admire him for that. When I was watching that, I'm thinking, this man, who, you know, especially when he proved that, you know, what, yeah. you're lying. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. And that's... Have you ever heard of the uh, gentleman? I can't remember his name right offhand, but back in the nineties, the mid nineties, he uh, put aside five hundred million dollars for anyone to, to bring him unintangible proof of the existence of ghosts, 
aliens or cryptids. I kind of remember something along yeah. those lines. He says, I will give you $500 million if you can bring me this proof. Then it stands up in court. And no one has yet been able to acquire the money. But oh. there again, it's because... We're living in this in this paradox of of reality versus this other reality, and we're walking that like I said that fine sword that, and it just either way you go, you're either on one side of the fence or the other. But this is something that's going to take time. To oh, sure. Really, I mean, people have been discussing this since the beginning of time. Literally, sure. the ancient gods were they aliens? Were uh, you know, stories of the of the ancient American natives as far as Sasquatch mm-hmm. uh, being around from their times, uh, encounters with, with strange lights and strange beings and, and elemental creatures. The earth and, this, and these mythos are based on something. Right. This is, and you can't say, because all these accounts were predate any type of modern, that you can say, well, they were influenced, you know, no, this is even before, you know, there was even white, nobody ever, you know, influenced them to come up with these stories of, like you said, of Sasquatch or Bigfoot type mm-hmm. or anything like that, right. you right. know. And what's really interesting is when even, let's say, when you have these tribes that were different parts of the country who had no type of connection or communication, they had very similar descriptions exactly. for Bigfoot type creatures, not exactly the exactly. same, but very similar. Mm-hmm. You exactly. Know, that you have to ask yourself, okay, so where does that come from? Well, you even look at at the mythos of religion in general, the the theology of all of the ancient cultures had one thing in common: they always had a supreme deity, mm-hmm. and then they had sub deities. Yes. Uh, even in Christianity today, we have the supreme deity and sub deities being the saints. Yes. And they all serve the same kind of functions. The Native Americans, the same story. So all of those different cultures, they never intermixed, but their right. ideologies are very similar in stature and nature. Right. So where did they come from? What was the basis? What was the root? And I think it is because of who we are, what we are, whether it be printed in our DNA or what, I'm not sure. But there is a like I like to call it a cosmic connection, because we're all worshiping the same things, but just right. under different names. And a different name. Or, exactly. And, you know, like I was saying about uh, the leprechauns and the elves and the aliens, all bear similarities, but different by name. And, and again, culture. you could say, well, you know, at the time that these things were, you know, it depends on, I guess, the people describe things based on what they see and and i'm mm-hmm. sure you've heard like you know the show ancient aliens where they're describing they're trying to make that connection between these stories of from ancient civilizations that could be interpreted to be contact with extraterrestrial life mm-hmm. and sometimes you could say wow they're reaching but then you think okay if i was alive in that time and i didn't understand like you know flying saucers or or anything like that mm-hmm. you know Maybe I would describe it this way, the way they describe it. You know, I wouldn't be giving Absolutely. a detailed report of, you know, the you know had so many horsepower. You know, it was like, I, I do see what? fire in the sky or I saw this and that, you know. Um, so I, I, yeah. I definitely believe that, that uh, even from back then, you know, whether it's the same ones that we have now, but I think what? we were visited by... By extraterrestrial oh, I do too. I believe that our cultures were influenced by it. There are things that we cannot explain. To this day, nobody can explain how the pyramids were made. They can yeah, they come up with all of these suggestions and so on. But the, the dynamics behind it, the Egyptians didn't even have the wheel yes. at that point. And the sandy and, soil and everything. And the sandy soil. Exactly. So how were these great marvels completed? How was their science so much more sophisticated? Mm-hmm. Then what we gave them respect for, and that includes all of the ancient races. Yes, and the rocks in Peru and in the, their buildings—you can't even put a a, a a piece of paper right. through because they're so intricately cut with chips or, or with uh, with hammers and chisels. I and they're saying, so. and you know that the, that they're astronomically, you know. Oh. 
built just, to go inside, and it's like, okay, this so wasn't just erecting it. It was erecting it under specific placement, in other words. Absolutely. And some of the the history that some of these ancient aboriginal uh, uh, cultures have that describe certain star systems that we're just now discovering. Able to see. Really, truly, truly exist. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So how did they have foreknowledge of this? Unless somebody came and explained it to them. And I think that in our development, that they probably did interact with us. There probably is cross DNA yeah. elements, I, and maybe I, they I, are I still. Possible. And I think maybe they are still just checking up on their experiments. Now, that's not to say that that uh, don't get me wrong that I don't believe in God, but I also right. believe that we all, every creature on this planet in this universe, probably has free will and free choice, and right. so those elements can be interchanged. This, these particular planets, planet, whatever, could have made in a, a mass improvement to the society because they could have probably been using what was needed for their resources at the site, at the time. Maybe the story of the Anunnaki isn't so far off, but I to ask me if I truly believe it, not really. A planet that only orbits the Earth once every million years, it would get pretty cold out in space, I think. But Unless they had a Dyson sphere. I mean, there's always something that you could branch off to to try to come up with the answer. But well, over- even if you don't get it exactly right, though, there's yeah. always that thing of that you're approaching. I mean, without having physically been back there, you know, like, and as far as I know, we don't do time travel yet, yet. Yeah. Uh, but you know that we can never for for sure say what was there, what wasn't there. Exactly. exactly. And this is how it played out. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, and, and I, yeah, I think that that possibility history- is. No, our awesome. history is 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 destroyed because history is written by the victors. Oh yeah, this, and and the conquerors. The yes. true history of the world is unknown. Yes, we have lost so much. I mean, seriously, we don't know how the pyramids were built. All of that time between those periods of conquest and conquering, we have no no clue, because again, it was by the interpreter of the conqueror, and the real function we just take for granted. And, well, that's, and, that, and, that's, it's a and it's really funny because all this history, like you said, whoever wrote the history, that this is the way we're going to say it, that after a while, everybody thinks that's the real thing. And then exactly. now that's the only hope I have that that true history will be, you know, researched and that it is what it is, you know, and that it's absolutely, you know, whether it's exactly what was taught or exposed. Mm-hmm. But I, I have a feeling that a lot of it is not exactly no, what's been it's, put out it's there. Not. It's not. It's propaganda in many ways. I mean, it's based on actual events, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But, again, it's in the interpretation of the storyteller. Uh, We're never going to, unless we could actually get a spirit to sit down with us and say, what really happened back at your time? Yes. To to explain to us exactly what, what occurred. And we probably would all be very, very, very surprised if we actually did know the real truth. There's an old saying, if the um, Egyptians had not been conquered and the uh, libraries at uh, uh, Constantinople, I believe it was, Alexandria. had not been destroyed. Alexandria, thank you. Uh, Alexandria had not been destroyed. We'd be flying to the moon or, or flying yes, in spaceships the that they to had the moon in that, uh, at that, that time. library were like astounding. They were like, it was incredible the amount of knowledge, yeah. but of course, you know, yeah. it was like, yeah. all it would take all is lost. a fire. All lost, and that's that's the tragedy of history, is we we have lost things, and uh, you know again, or it's been rewritten to to appease that's certain elements. What I'm talking about rewritten, omitted, massaged, mm-hmm. exactly. whatever your choice of words is, it's not exactly accurate. But anyway, exactly. Chris, I am so this was a great interview. I loved it. I loved oh, it. Thank you. I, mean, I did too. I, I'm going to have you back because Wonderful. you are so interesting. <laughs> well, okay, you. you're so interesting. And like one of the things I love that you recognize is that paranormal is not just ghosts. Okay. Yeah. There are so many aspects to paranormal investigations. Mm-hmm. Okay. There is, yes, the ghost or life after death or near-death experience. There's cryptids. There's UFOs. There's you know alien contact i mean there's it's like to me it's and i say it this, to me despite all this stuff with the reality shows it's never yeah. been more interesting than it is now right okay yeah. 
Um, number exactly. one, because I think it's a little bit more acceptable. Okay. It is. We have a lot of technology now that helps us document it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of other things that have yet to be discovered mm-hmm. that, you know, I, I want to say that either whether we prove it that it is that way or it's not, it's mm-hmm. to, to me, it's always going to help us as humans, you know, sure. uh, advance. So to, you know, and, and I can see that you think it about it the same way that it's exactly that there's a whole spectrum of things that fall into it, you know. Uh, well, I, I think we, if we can work together as groups and and different teams and members and unity, yeah. right? a lot of people hate that word unity, but I think it's strongly important yes. because, again, it, only working together are we going to discover the mysteries of the universe. And yes. uh, no individual is going to be able to come forward. It's like the old saying I said once before, you can break a pencil easily uh, just by snapping it in two. But if you've got... 15 pencils tied together, you cannot break it. No. And I want to tell you something. A lot of people say, well, you know, uh, all these uh, universities, if if they have a department that actually deals with this, sometimes they, they, whether they even want to have people out in the field doing it or the pockets or the the scientists, it's I think it's yeah. people like us who are out in the field, okay, mm-hmm. who actually do the legwork Okay, yeah. of doing all these cases and documenting Absolutely. it, okay, that do what this guy in the university or in a department yeah. can't do for whatever exactly. reason. Exactly. You know. And I think that's that's key right there. What you said is that paranormal studies need to be a part of the coursework of colleges yes. nowadays. Hodges University asked me to come and teach their teach these courses, and I was glad to do so. And I came to discover that my class was the highest number rated program at the university wow. and the most highest rated attended because people are always going to be curious. They're always yes. going to want to know if there's something else beyond this life, and they're just fascinated by the what-ifs. And there's just far too few programs out there, and uh, it, it's a shame because there could be so much more. Right, but you know what, and and for you to go ahead, like, and be able to present a class, okay, which is great. I think it's fantastic. Before you never, if you ever, I want to take a person, or uh, they'd be like, "Huh, You're, what are you talking about?" Yeah, yeah, get out, yeah. But again, like, and you were able to present, you know, evidence or what you know is like this. I mean, I can't say for certain, but it was grounded in science along yeah. with people that have gone out there and do it all the time, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm saying is that these science departments or whatever, and all these university are places that are of higher learning, you know, that are going to be the bastions of acceptance. You know, if somebody ever wants to prove something, Mm -hmm. they do not have the manpower or the time to do what serious paranormal investigators do for this field. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. They They don't, they They don't, don't. they don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that eventually, if any proof or whatever that's ever going to be found, it's going to be from a paranormal group Absolutely. who's going to be able to Absolutely. capture whatever it is. I'm not saying ghosts. It could be anything that's going to have to be that, the, that, that impeccable timing that they're going to be the ones that are then going to be able to take it to, you know, get it verified. And then, of course, you know, mm-hmm. science. <laughs> and exactly. I, I don't mean that because exactly. I, I, I'm, I, I'm part scientist myself is going to say, well, sure. guess what? I think that there might be this, but mm-hmm. I think it's the us people that run around, like you said, sometimes going without sleep. Sure, exactly. That are going to provide the proof. Absolutely. Well, I always like to say, if I'm having heart surgery, I want a surgeon, not a plumber. Sure. And even though they both know the internal workings, I'd rather have the surgeon. Sure, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Chris, it has been fantastic. I'm going to have you back on again because we're going to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials. There you go. I've got, (laughs) you know, volumes of stories on those as well. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Okay. It has been fantastic. And thank thank you you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me to be on your show. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So guys, I don't know. Okay. I loved it. 
you know, <laughs> as you can tell, you can tell when I'm like over the moon with a guest and I am, I think Chris just again, you know, to me, um, I have, I think since I've been doing paranormal investigations for so long and you come across somebody that has also been doing it. Okay. And what we said, you know, when you get, when we got involved in this, you know, not as, you know, I think all kids go through that stage where they read ghost stories, but when you still pursue it into adulthood and you're actually involved in it, okay, as an adult, back when we were doing it, that back then you did get a lot of sideways glances like, you do what? You, you like, whoa, that's like, it, believe me, it wasn't like it is now. And some people were cool about it and other people weren't. But that you understand you've seen the progress and what's happened in this field. But but again, that's the thing that in all this time, you pick up all this experience, information, stories. And that's the thing. Not every time are you going to have a camera or whatever to record it. Some things happen or somebody comes up to you and tells you a story or show something to you that the only thing you've got going is your eyes and your ears. For example, what he described what happened to him when he was in high school. That all of a sudden he found himself right smack in the middle of an exorcism. Okay. Um, what he thought was going to be like, oh, I'm going to go with the priest and help him out, do something, whatever. That happens. And that's what I'm saying that as you go along, you pick up all this information that to me, when I interview somebody like Christopher George, to me, it's like he has so many stories, okay, so many personal experiences. And not all of them are going to be going to have a photograph or recording or this or that, but things that happen to you on a personal level or when you're in an investigation or, you know, things that happen to your team members that these are the kind of stories that I think that are fascinating. They're fascinating. And a lot of times uh, it's not the, the regular you know, all the haunted places or landmarks that everybody hears about, or like we were talking about the Amityville Horror, you know, everybody's heard about the Amityville Horror. And he gave a very interesting slant to that, by the way. Okay, I personally had never heard that Mr. Lutz had some type of possibly any involvement in, you know, black magic. We'll find out and see. I think that's very interesting. I had never heard of that. But getting back to that, Everybody's heard of the Amityville Horror, okay? But what I like is when you talk to somebody with this many years of experience, you're going to hear about cases and experiences that you're not going to read in any book. You're not, okay? It's not until you speak to them and act, people actually will talk. Sometimes for the first time, they'll say, you know what? One time I was at this place or sometimes I... And guess what happened? And you're like, really? And then people trade information. So... I, personally as a paranormal investigator that's what I like I love that and I really hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I did I hope you like this video and you subscribe to my channel and you come back every Friday okay and uh, follow up with me and see who's the next person that I bring on or you see me tramping around doing some investigation into something you know and again I welcome your comments about what you would like to see more of certain guest or certain subject uh you know oh, by the way <laughs> i have to mention this there was one time where i had a i heard a cat meow and i know it had to have been on his end because i was for a minute that was like wait a minute i don't have any cats i hope that was on his end otherwise i've got a phantom cat meowing in the middle of this interview <laughs> but anyway guys uh, have a great rest of the week. I really enjoy bringing this to you. I hope you enjoy it. And again, please subscribe to my channel. Take care.